Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Welcome to the house of God, those who are here with us and those who are watching virtually. We are going to begin, my name is Dr. Toussaint Williams, and we're going to begin Sabbath school today as we bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that it is for us to come in your presence. The fact that you allow us one more time to hear your voice through the word of God, we are so thankful for that. And we're asked that you give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now before we get started, I need you to have a smile on your face. I need you to have a smile on your face for a number of reasons, not just for the fact that you woke up this morning, but we are witnessing a miracle. We are witnessing a what? A miracle. Over to my left, you're right, I see a bald head just like mine. That is brother Dr. Prigg, Benson Prigg. He has been away for a while, but I saw you today. I'm going to acknowledge you now and later. Praise God. He has had a number of health challenges, but God bless him. He said he owes me something, and you know what you owe me, but I know that we're excited that you and your wife are here with us today. Praise God for you. This week, also, we're doing something a little bit different in that we're looking at the social justice, looking at element of social justice. And just for the month of February, we're going to look, look at social justice in the Word of God. Some of you may have you, those who are with us here today, may have this lesson. This is the lesson we're going to work with for this particular month. For the next few weeks, we're going to look at social justice in the Word of God. This week, we're going to look specifically at Jesus' ministry in social justice and what that looks like and how we can apply it to our daily lives. Just a quick update for those who are a part of Bible 101 or would like to be a part of Bible 101. This is an online Bible study that we have every Monday at 6 o'clock. This Monday, we will not have our, our time together, but we will connect again the following Monday. So if you would like to be a part of that, just send us an email at info at OUCSDA.org. All right. So if you're watching online, you would like to identify how can I get this particular book, Social Justice in the Word of God, want to make sure that you go to Amazon, you can come to the Oakwood University Church office or identify from the South Central Conference and many other areas. If you just want to call the office, 256-837-1255. But if you are in the building, just raise your hand and we have individuals that are going to come and bring you a particular book. I have individuals over here to my right, please identify them. We have some interns that are going to pass them out. So we're going to get started asking the question, why social justice? The idea of why in the world we pause just to identify social justice. Because there's sometimes some superstitious suspicions about this term, social justice. Social justice literally means to make right one's relationship with God to others, to God, to others, and natural creation. Social justice is simply how can I make things right with God, with my fellow man, and with natural creation. The idea, social justice, assures equal opportunity for all. So when we're talking about social justice, the idea is how can we have equal opportunity for everyone, notwithstanding someone's religious affiliation, legal or political economic status, or other circumstances of birth or natural origin. In other words, how can we make this thing fair? Now this started, we're talking about the ministry of Jesus, but didn't, did not start with Jesus' birth. No, it started in the Old Testament. In fact, it starts with the idea of the Sabbath, the idea that God wants everyone and everything to rest, making everything on an even playing field. The Bible says, even though everything's not equal because of sin, the Bible gives us this admonishment in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Some of you know this right now. It says, he has shown thee, O man, what is what? What is what? What is good and what does the Lord require of thee? What does God require from you and I? It says, to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Our job, our design, the purpose why we are here, in spite and in the difficulties of sin, God wants us to do everything we can to make sure someone else has just as good a life as we do. You guys know the song, If I Could Help Somebody As I Walk Along, If I Can Cheer Somebody With a Word or Song, If I Can Show Someone That They're Traveling Wrong, Then My Living will not be in vain. So there's several areas we're going to address today talking about Jesus' earthly ministry. We're going to focus on his birth, his treatment of women, the marginalized in society, those who are sexually abused, and government and religious leaders. And each one of these areas deals with specifically social justice. For a second, let's think about 
the birth of Jesus. Now, I've had the privilege of having two beautiful, healthy kids, and both of my boys were born in hospitals. Now, I didn't have the privilege of carrying them for nine months, but I can only imagine the joy that occurred. I re remember very vividly on uh, the birthdays, the, boy, the my boys' birthdays, of how my wife responded and those wonderful experiences and the things that she said and shared to me on that particular day, Pastor Ross. But I can only imagine if she would have had to have those experiences, not just on a farm, not just in a barn, but in a manger. No epidural. <laughs> Not just an epidural, but no friends to help. And the only person there to assist her was her husband. This is the type and the way that the Messiah, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords was gonna come to this earth the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, that this Messiah was going to come like a shoot from a stump. This was a signal that the, the Messiah that was going to come was not going to be a grand and a great king. No, this individual is going to be one, just like the Bible says in Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1 through 3, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Now, this is interesting because you Bible students know that David was the son of Jesse, the idea that Jesse was supposed to have the, uh, a great clan, and, but, but throughout life and because of sin, Jesse's lineage uh, was, was cut down to the point where there was no more person from Jesse's lineage in charge. But the Bible says, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and of his understanding, and the spirit of counsel and of might, and the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The Bible identifies from the Old Testament all the way to the New that Jesus, when he was going to come, was not going to be a, have some, fancy, some, some great fancy fair. There was not going to be in a beautiful hospital. No, Jesus was going to come from the least, the lowliest, the left out. Jesus specifically in each of the four Gospels talk about the fact that Joseph and Mary came from obscure, poor, humble backgrounds, so much so that John says when talking about uh, these, the, the, this Messiah, the, 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 the disciples were talking to one another, and the question was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, if, if there's this Messiah is supposed to come out of now, there's no way in the world from that particular hood, no way in the world from that particular area, from that ghetto, can anything come? And here we're seeing Jesus is identifying, even from his birth, that he wants to associate, not just with those who have money, those who literally have nothing. Jesus was born in a society ruled by racism and perpetu perpetuated by hate. Jesus' birth is, and his life focused on how he labored vigilantly to restore the physical and spiritual dignity of those who were socially impoverished. And one group specifically was the group of women. All my women, just wave your hand. Just wave your hand. All of the ladies, each of you would not be considered fully as a full citizen. In fact, as you'll see on the next side, you guys are just a little bit above that of a slave. Can you imagine now when Jesus comes, and the Bible talks about it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, when he created Adam and Eve, the idea that God created mankind in his own image, he created them male and female, he created them both men and women, were created in the image of God. Some of them said, amen. Amen. <laughs> And that's correct. We both were created in the image of God. And so much so, that's the reason why God loves the institution of marriage so much. Because you can't fully talk about the, 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 the image of God with just man alone. It's man and a woman that God created, and both of them together form the image of God. One was not better or worse than the other. The only thing that occurred when, when this idea of this separation occurred happened after sin. So it was taught women were regarded as intellectually, morally, spiritually, and physically inferior to men. Many times in Scripture, women didn't even count. 
you know, imagine treated slaves without moral or legal authority. So much so, as you read the Bible, think about this, the reason why women were so excited about having a child, specifically a male child, because that was their claim to actually having some type of status in society. And so for a woman not to be able to bear children is almost worse than being a slave. Why? Because she, that was the only thing. They did not have 401ks. They could not go out to get a job. They could not become CEOs. They, they couldn't do anything in and of themselves. All they could do was bear children. And this is the type of society that our Lord and Savior not just lived in, not just born in, but showed us there has to be a better way. Notice what Jesus did, talking about social justice. Jesus addressed females in public, which was taboo. Jesus was intentional about making sure women were a part of the parables. Jesus was, 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 actually, was focused on miraculous female healings over and over throughout the Word of God. He made sure women were included in his evangelistic team. Could it be possible that this idea that women are a little bit lower or less than even in our society in 2022? then there must be a need for social justice. Jesus focused on the idea that he enhanced the status and the roles of women. Jesus did not gloss, gloss over their lives, saying that they were not to be condoned or confronted. He specifically wanted to make sure that women, just like men, were a part of his creation, and he loved them just the same. Now, this can be seen even more than in the story of Mary when she was caught in adultery. They said in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 7, it says, But when they saw it, they complained, saying, He has gone to be a, a guest with a man who is a sinner. His name was Simon. He was a ruler. Simon was a popular guy. Simon was the one that everybody wanted to be around. It was common thought from Jewish leaders that the people that were socially marginalized were outside the reach of God's mercy. In other words, if you were poor, God did not love you. If you did not have status, God was not on your side. So the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the individuals with handicaps, anyone that had an infirmity, the culturally outcast, the race based on race, gender, color, or national origin, Jesus showed that he came to hang with everyone. There was nobody that was outside of his grasp. There was nobody that did too much or had gone too far for Jesus to say, nah, I can't, I can't get down with you. And so we see in the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, the Lord, Jesus says this, the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The idea that Jesus was trying to show is that he came so that those people who were cast out or left out of society, those were the ones that he wanted to save. Those are the wanted ones we wanted to cut, put, put his hand on their hand because just because the religious leaders of the time left them out did not mean that God was trying to push them away. Just because the individuals, and think about this family, God allowed sinners to show other people a false glimpse of who God was. He did not strike these religious leaders down, which he should have if it would have been me. If you make mis misrepresent, we don't like people talking about us just but by word. Can you imagine God? You're literally representing God, the, the Father, and these were the ones that were in charge of the church. And Jesus was saying, I hear you, I see what's going on, and I'm going to show you a better way. The ideas, the evils of society were many. These individuals in the church and also in government would defraud others. They would have unholy taxation. They would steal other people's goods. They would uh, deny opportunity for acquire life's necessities. And then, after putting in place areas and laws and systems to, 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 to oppress individuals, they would look down on those individuals that they oppress and say, man, God does not love you. They were cursed by God. They were denied jobs and society. And, and then going back to this idea of women, can you imagine your sister, 
your daughter, your aunt, or your mother in this story. One of the things that this lesson brings out is the idea of how Jesus treated individuals that had a sinful lifestyle. Now, I know none of you in here have ever sinned. I know you may not be able to relate to anything I'm going to talk about today. But just imagine, hypothetically, if this were the case. If somehow you got caught up or messed up with, with somebody that was not your husband, what if just the case, just, just hypothetically, again, hypothetically, you found yourself in a bed that was not yours? Just again, and, and this, is, this is not anybody in here, I know nobody in here has ever had made a mistake or gone like in this particular area, I, I know that. Um, but, but perhaps, perchance. Maybe somebody slipped something in your drink. We don't know what happened to get this individual in this particular case. But the Bible says they caught this woman in the very act of adultery. In order for somebody to catch her in the act, they had to, they had to know the other individual that was in the act. But in this particular story in John chapter 8, the, end of the man never is never brought to justice. Nowhere in the Bible is ever the man say, hey, weren't you with her? Were you not there? How did they know this was going to happen at this particular time? But these individuals, the religious leaders, set this woman up so that they could set Jesus up to let them know they could care less about the people that they were in charge and professed to love and to care for. So they bring her. Prayerfully, she was wrapped in a sheet. And throw her at the feet of Jesus. Can you imagine having Sabbath school right now when somebody gets thrown in here? They, they, they can't help you. They're only my feet. But I'll pray for you. But the idea here, Jesus the Messiah. Can you imagine the, 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 the law said they should stone her? The law said that they should take her at that very moment to kill her. And if Jesus would have said stone her, they would say, hey, you're trying to kill people. And then if Jesus said you would allow them, and then you're not God. And over and over again, Jesus had to show them who he was. And watch this idea, this element of social just, justice. The Bible says Jesus stooped down and began to write. And as he's writing, the Bible says, not, 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 look at this. It says, not when they saw it, when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest. You know, I, I think this is where that idea where you put the finger up, they start putting the finger up and start tiptoeing out. I, I think this is where it started. When they started seeing how Jesus began to write in the sand, and it does not identify what their sins were. Praise God, God extends grace even for those who are in the very act of sinning. He writes in the sand, notice the Bible says, each one beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. The woman caught in the very act. Notice Jesus does not say, sis, you're good. Nobody's here to accuse you. He says, go and what? Sin no more. You can love the sinner while condemning the sin, but you have to love the sinner first before you address the sin. And she repaid him this way. The Bible says later on, we don't know how long, but there was a party, a, 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 a gathering at Simon's house. Simon, who used to be a leper, that was cleansed. His leprosy was cleansed, and he is in right, right shape with God. And he begins to have this beautiful party that he throws out, and all of a sudden, there's an individual that comes, and there's a... Mm. That smells real good. Simon, what, 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 what kind of scent is that? Lilac? Peppermint? Violet? What, what is going on? This is a beautiful scent. And they see... This woman, a woman that they've seen before, but she looks a little bit different this time. 
And that aroma comes from something she's holding in her hands. They call it an alabaster box. The Bible says in Mark 14, verse number 3, being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he sat at meat, and there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. Here we have this second-class citizen. We have this woman on the outskirts of society. We have this individual that, that everybody said should be shunned. She saw the Messiah and recognize what he did for her publicly. And what she says is, man, I know that this is going to be the one that's going to die. I know this was, the reason why he's going to die is because of my sins. And she said, you don't know the cost of the oil. You don't know the cost of my praise. You don't know the cost of the oil in this alabaster box. And Mary begins to anoint his head with oil and, and washes his feet with her tears. And the crazy thing about it is, People are saying, why would she spend all this money on this? This money could be going to the poor, Judas. And other people said, just Jesus know he's hanging out with sinners, and he wanted to let them know this is the reason why he came. Family, Jesus sets an example for us so that we can know as great as our suits are, as cute as you are behind your mask, the reason why God blesses you and allows you to have what you have is because there's going to be somebody that's need for you to extend the same grace God has given you. And the only way we can truly understand justice is to know what God has done for us. We can't get caught up in the great things we are, the blessings that we are right now. No, no, think about where you were before God came into your life, where you were before you, 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 you. We, we see your smiles and we saw the car that you drove up in. We, 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 we've been by your house and we know where our things are now. But if you ever forget that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, What I love about this text, the Bible says that he brought you out with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand. And that's the reason why social justice is so important. And the challenge that for people who are formerly oppressed, when they are free, expect or think other people should come up by their own bootstraps. No, that's not the way of the Christian. That's not the way of the cross. Here what we see in the life and the ministry of Jesus is that he did everything he could to make sure somebody who was marginalized by society knew that he loved them. To know that he cared, and most importantly, he has this place prepared for them when he comes again. And here's the challenge to the Christian, to every believer. Are the people around you blessed because of your presence? Do they identify that there's something different? Does somebody who's left out of society, do they know that there's someone who cares because the God that you serve? For the rest of this quarter, the rest of this month, we're going to have an opportunity to look at this idea of social justice. Next week, we're going to look at social justice in the book of Revelation. Take an opportunity to study this particular lesson, and we're going to spend and have a phenomenal time next week. If you need one, just raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one before you leave worship service today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for social justice. Guide our hearts and our minds so that we can serve the individuals just the way that you did when you're here on earth. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath and welcome to the Oakwood University Church Experience. I'm Linda Anderson and I'm pleased to be here this morning. And I am Pastor Paul Goodridge and I'm also uh, thrilled to be here, excited to be here this morning. I had uh, quite a week. Okay. I'm, I'm sure you had quite a week as well. But I'm alive, I'm blessed, I'm thankful, mm. and I have no complaints. Complaining does nothing but exercise the vocal cords. <laughs> I'd rather use them to do something more melodious. Absolutely, absolutely. I know Pastor Snell talked about 
praising in advance yes. last week. Yes, he did. You know, in spite of even if you're in the midst of your circumstance, still praise, still let God know that you appreciate being here. Did you practice that this week? I tried to. I you tried got to. got a flat tire, just say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I almost I got a flat tire. Fl- that, oh, my. Yeah, I was... I was Driving on the highway, and I almost got a flat tire. Oh, well, so. praise the Lord for almost. But I'm here. Yes, I'm here. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Amen. Well, we want to say good morning to several individuals who are good morning. <laughs> We're getting a knock on the window. Yes. I thought it was the Lord saying, Linda, <laughs> hurry. Um, but we want to say good morning and happy Sabbath to Zoe, uh, to the Music Man RN, to Skoka, and to Dorsalyn Miller. Yes. Now, actually, Zoe, I think, was the first person on our, on, at least on the YouTube side. Oh, beautiful. In terms of, of joining us. I want to say good morning to Janet Payne as well. I see um, this morning uh, Keys Universe is there, so good morning to all of you. Absolutely. Uh, also, um, uh, Ab Gomez, 8514, happy Sabbath to you. Uh, Disciple of Jesus, 73, happy Sabbath. And a couple of international people, uh, Cooking with Mrs. Showers mm-hmm. from Bermuda, and also, uh, a, a place dear to my heart, because it's where my father was born, uh, Yolanda Phillips from Barbados. Oh, so wonderful. happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And thank Sabbath. you for joining us. Happy Sabbath. Now, we also have some birthday uh, greetings that we want to give. Uh, these are individuals who have had a birthday this week. Okay. And so we have Esther Benjamin. Happy birthday happy to you. Birthday. Ed Liv Noel. Ed Liv, one of my former students. Okay, happy yes. Birthday, happy Ed birthday Liv. to you. Joel Rachuano, one of our young people. Happy birthday. Uh, Esther Provost, happy birthday to happy you. Birthday. And Shalanda White, one of our uh, ushers. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And then we have uh, some birthdays also coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, a few this week, but some coming up. We want to say happy birthday to Jochebed De Canal, uh, one of our Bible workers. Yes, yes. Uh, we'd like to say happy birthday to Maurice Vanterpool mm-hmm. and to Linda Edgecombe and to Jason Lewis. And I would be remiss if I didn't say happy birthday to my very own daughter, oh, okay. Brooke Anderson Colley, turning 28th this year. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to say happy birthday, the best thing that ever happened to me. Amen. I tell people she was born the day after Valentine's Day. The best Valentine's Day gift I ever received was an epidural. <laughs> Well, I can't say that in terms of epidural, <laughs> but uh, three days after Valentine's Day, we had uh, my wife oh. gave birth to our daughter, Catherine. She's so lovely. So Catherine, uh, her birthday's on the 17th, and I had to just let you know, Catherine, I love you. Oh. Happy birthday to you. And uh, I have that shotgun, but no, I shouldn't say that online. Okay. I, <laughs> yes, right. we do. That's all right. Daddies can say that. <laughs> Happy birthday. She's a lovely girl. Absolutely. Well, so, we're so glad uh, so to we be also, here today. Actually, we have some anniversaries okay. that, that we want to recognize. Uh, Otis and Jacqueline Malone. They're Beautiful. celebrating their 24th an- wedding anniversary on February the 15th. 24 years. And uh, one of our deacons here, uh, Kevin and Janet Jackson, uh, they're celebrating their 35th wedding anniversary Beautiful. on February 14th, Valentine's Beautiful. Day. Happy, so happy anniversary, anniversary. Happy Kevin anniversary. and Janet Jackson, a different Janet Jackson, but, yes. but happy birthday to you. Um, well, we also want to um, make a few announcements this week. Okay. Uh, so, Pastor, as you know, this month we're celebrating Black History Month. And the Oakwood University Church, in conjunction with the Breath of Life television ministry, is following the theme, Reigniting the Movement. And so today we'll be focusing on black love. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Snell will be preaching on the topic, It Never Goes Like You Planned It. This should be exciting. But there's also another special uh, event happening this afternoon. So why don't you tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. So this afternoon, uh, beginning at 3 p.m., uh, we're going to have a, a symposium, a Black Love Symposium. So now um, we can put the flyer back on, uh, Black Up. Yes, there you go. So we're going to have our symposium uh, beginning at 3 o'clock. Now the Zoom rooms uh, will open um, at, or the Zoom lobby will open at 2.45. And I know that last week we had a, a few challenges, but we've ironed those out. So we want to invite you to join us at 2.45 Central Time where um, we will uh, begin at 3 o'clock our um, uh, uh, Zoom uh, Black Love Seminars. Now, uh, in order to access it, we want you to go to 
uh, if you're on the Oakwood University Church platform, we want to, you to go to OUCSDA.org forward slash black love. And if you're on the Breath of Life platform, go to breathoflife.tv uh, forward slash black love. And that, will, that link will take you to a page where it says click here. And once you click the word here, it will take you directly into the Zoom uh, room. You don't want to miss that. Last week was very, very informative and enjoyable, so you want to be there this afternoon. Absolutely. And then our Bible 101 study takes place with Pastor Dr. Toussaint Williams. Uh, they won't be meeting this Monday, February 14th at 6 o'clock, but they will resume on February the 21st, 2022. And if you'd like more information, again, go to uh, send an email to mm -hmm. info at OUCSDA.org. Okay. Um, also, uh, we continue our food distribution. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. at the Family Life Center, we uh, distribute food to anybody in need. You don't have to be a member of the church, although members are welcome, but this is an initiative that we seek to do every week for our community. So we just want to let you know that this Wednesday at 11 o'clock, we will have our food distribution. Well, we're in for an exciting worship experience, and we're so thankful that you have decided to join us. And so we're going to now go to our worship service, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you after the service right here. Thank you for joining us. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome to the worship experience of the Oakwood University Church. Located on the campus of Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, and the home of the Breath of Life Television Ministries. Experience worship where Christ is first. Lives are transformed. And sharing God's love flows freely. Welcome to the Oakwood University Church Worship Experience. Bless the Lord, everybody. One more time, bless the Lord, everybody. We came to worship the Lord this morning. If you just stand up to your feet, we're going to welcome the presence of the Lord into this place. Come on, you know the song. Let's sing it. Say welcome. Welcome into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a place where you can live. A place where you can leave your cares behind. We invite you to come on in. Come on in and happy. Your Where you can find hope for oh, the hopeless strength for the weak side for the blind. Let's say it one more time. Welcome. Welcome into the house of the Lord. We know it's a place where you can shelter. A place where you can shelter from the rain. Everybody say, look around. Look around. Say with thanksgiving. Say with thanks. With thanksgiving. 
thanksgiving. We bless your name, God. With thanksgiving. If you believe it, open up your mouth, please. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, can you just say amen? amen. If God has been amazing to you this week, can you just shout hallelujah? hallelujah? If God didn't treat you as your sins deserve, can you just raise your hands and let your neighbor know that he's still merciful? He's still grateful. He's still loving. He's still caring because he still loves sinners like you and myself. If you're glad that God still hates the sin but still loves the sinner, just give God some praise right now. Amen, amen, amen. Today's call to worship will be taken from Psalms 136, and it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. Why? Yeah, yeah. For his uh -huh. mercy uh -huh. endures forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, kind and heavenly Father, Lord, as we're in your house today, we're praying for a blessing like no other. We're praying that your spirit touch everybody underneath the sound of my voice and let somebody's life be transformed by your spirit and by your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of God. If you, have, if you, have a, if you don't have a smile on your face, you've got to remain standing. So everybody seated has to have a smile on your face. Good to be in the house of God this Sabbath. There are a number of reasons to be thankful. Let's take, let's inhale. Exhale, keep your mask on. All right, all right. We, we, that, that, there's a reason to be thankful for it. Look to your left and your right. You have somebody there on your life. The Bible says where two or three are gathered. There he is in the midst. So we have a promise that we are holding on to. We are excited. Mr. Drew Petty, I'm so excited to see you. I'm excited, praising God, that God is continuing blessing. We're praying with that miracle that the Lord is working in your life. I'm also excited. Some of you are here during Sabbath school. I'm really excited. I want to ask Brother Dr. Benson Prigg to stand to his feet right now. Um, Dr. Prigg has been away for a while, and this is my first time laying eyes on him. And so I'm excited, Pastor Dr. Prigg. We praise God. He had a bout. We had a, he had a bout with COVID. The devil said, tried to take my Lord said, no, that is my child. We're not done with him yet. There's still yet a work for you to do. And so we praise God for that miracle of life. We praise God for what he is going to do and has done. And so if you came and unsure of what God can do, we have living and walking miracles, understanding in spite of what the enemy is going to try to do, what the devil meant for evil, God can turn around and make it for good. And so I'm going to be excited today, ecstatic, because God is doing great things here at the Oakwood University Church. A couple of announcements I want to make sure that you are aware of. This month has a number of special things that we're going to do. This month of Black History, we're several, several major things, emphasis we are doing. Last week, we talked about Black health. Today, we're focusing on Black love. I know some of you are excited about Monday. Um, we're going to be going to the store later on this evening after sunset, making sure you have something special for your special someone. Others are just saying, hey, I'm glad to be alive. May not worry, be worried about specific Valentine's Day, but I know that there's somebody who loves me greater than any earthly person. That Jesus himself has done everything he can to describe and to show his love for us, and we're excited about that. Next week, we're focusing on love and excellence, black love, black wealth and black excellence. You want to make sure that you are aware and ready for that. Speaking of wealth, we want to let you know one of the services that our stewardship department does is free tax preparations. So if you would like to have your taxes taken care of, just stop by the office one day this week and we'll make sure that you get those things uh, available. All the information, the documents, or we'll make sure that you have the documents together so you can be ready to go for this upcoming tax year. Now, last week, we had a phenomenal time with our Black Health Symposium. Today, we are going to continue that journey talking about Black love. Last week, there was a registration process for our Zoom meeting. We were able to work that out so you don't have to register. We also, there was a cap on our number last week. We were able to, we've been able to work, out, work that out so we don't have to worry about a cap or being pushed out. So you want to make sure today at 3 p.m., what time? 
3 p.m., that's going to begin our symposium. So we're going to have two different symposiums. They're right here on the screen, a number of them, so you have an opportunity to do at least two of them. So please make sure at 3 o'clock that you are there. We get the doors or registration or the lobby opens at 2.45. And again, this is a virtual um, symposium, so you don't have to be in the sanctuary. You can be in the comforts of your home. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity. We have a number of phenomenal presenters to make sure that you are aware of for this upcoming symposium today at 3 o'clock. Now, every Wednesday, we've been doing, God has been doing some great things. We just started this month our um, sign series. So I want to make sure if you caught last Wednesday, we know God richly blessed. This Wednesday is going to go higher and higher. We're talking about discerning God's direction for your life. And every Wednesday, Pastor Snell is working and teaching on that topic. So please make sure that you are aware of that. Talking about signs and what God is doing for our lives, one of the main reasons, well, the main reason why we are here is because men and women, give men and women, boys and girls, an opportunity to say yes to God's will and yes to to his way. Today, we have two individuals that said, Lord, we want to make sure we're doing what you called us to do. And when the appeal was made, they said, we want to say publicly yes to your will and yes to your way. Today, we have Jessica and Mark Dishman in the pool. They said, hey, together, we're going to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. So, subject to their baptism, I need a motion for somebody to say yes, so to accept Jessica and Mark to the Fellowship of the Faith at the Oakland University Church. There's been motion, there's a move. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? It is carried. I want the family, the fr friends, fellowships, supporters to stand on their feet. Today, Miss Jessica. We are excited about what God is going to do, and today marks a new day of life. Today is your birthday in Jesus Christ. We are excited about that. And we are going to baptize you today in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Be faithful until he comes. Amen. And what I love about this, it's a phenomenal thing that not just you're getting baptized but you and your wife are doing it together starting this thing off right I can't wait come on praise God and so today we seal this decision the decision that you made with, with heaven your name being written on the Lamb's book of life and we baptize you today in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit be faithful until he returns amen here. Reminded, let men, women, boys, and girls know that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And the fact that Christ loves us and is going to do everything he can, has done everything he can to save us. And he's putting you in someone's life so that they can experience the power of God. And that's the reason why we can praise God. That's the reason why we can worship. And I'm going to invite Brother Hector to come at this time to lead us in our praise and worship because we have something to praise God for today. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. We came to bless our risen Savior. We came to bless his name and talk about the many things that he is and everything that he is to us this morning. He has so many different names, but of course, we just want to call him by his name this morning. How many of y'all know that we serve Jesus? Hallelujah. We bless his name. Bread of life. You sent down from glory Many things you were on earth A holy king, a carpenter But you are the living word, say Sent down from glory Many things you were Many things you were on earth A holy king one more time, say bread. You are the living bread of heaven. You were sent down from glory. Many things you were. A holy God. Hallelujah. We call him awesome ruler. Awesome ruler. Gentle redeemer. You are God with us. God with us, the living truth, and what a friend we have in you. One more time, call us name, say awesome ruler, awesome ruler. gentle redeemer. You are God with us. And what a friend. There's nothing left to call him. We call him Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call. You were born in a manger. You died. Let's worship him in this place. Say Jesus, Jesus. That's what we call him.
this place hallelujah give him some glory in this place if you believe that he's worthy if you believe that he's holy if you believe that he's the living word bless his name hallelujah come on let us stand into our feet this morning as you know it is black history month and so of course we got to remember that we have come this far by faith uh, and i know that some of you know this so i just need you to rally up like some soldiers and just worship the lord with us uh, it says we can't turn around come on praise team let's say it say we've come
we've come this far. turn around. We've come this far by faith. Did anybody just want to reflect on where God brought you from? The valleys God brought you over, the things that God protected you from, that accident that should have taken you out, God kept you, and we recognize that we've come this far by faith. And so I can't turn around in spite of what the enemy tries to do. I have to keep on pushing because I am an arm, a soldier in the army of the Lord. I, I'm especially ecstatic because on the organ is Brother Stephen Manders. Earlier this week had a medical challenge, but I'm glad that you're, you're back and praising the Lord, doing what God has done. We praise God and we, we see God doing great things, but we come this time to acknowledge that God is, still has something better for us. In fact, if you ever hear somebody sing and they do a phenomenal job and before they walk off, some even people may say, encore. In other words, do it again. In our prayer time together, we're going to say, God, we need an encore. We've seen you do some great things, but I need you to do it again. I, I need you to step in one more time. I need you to pay that bill one more time to restore this relationship one more time. We're asking God to do an encore presentation. What he's been doing for centuries, even ages. We are praying for Vaughn Mountain and Chandra, Vaughn and Chandra Mountain are families experiencing some medical challenges. Continue to keep the Chandra Mountain's family in prayer. One of our members, Miss Marie Desirme, asking God to do a mighty and a mark work for her health. We praise God that she's been with us for this long time, and in spite of the challenges, she still believes in the power of prayer. This week has not always been the best for some. Some of our members have um, come to sickness, ultimately ending in a sleep. And we're praying for Bruce Papendick and his family. His funeral services will be today at the Spirit of the Cross Church at 2 o'clock. Bettina can keep um, that family in prayer. Tomorrow in this sanctuary, Brother Eugene Harris, his funeral service will be tomorrow at 11 o'clock here at the Oakwood University Church. And then next week, Sunday, um, one of our young adults, Miss Lakeisha Gustav, her funeral will be this sun that Sunday, February 20th at 11 o'clock here at the church. And also, we want to continue to keep in prayer Miss Jennifer Jones' family. This is the sister of our dear Bible worker, Miss Alice Morton. Um, she does a phenomenal job serving God and doing everything. She simply says asking the church to pray for her. Uh, the funeral services will be in the Ohio area, so please keep Miss Alice in prayer during this particular time. Family, don't let what the enemy's showing you right now shield what God wants to reveal to you by faith. Some of the experiences that you're going through are going to be the very things that's going to carry you across the threshold to eternity. Our job is to trust him to hold on to the promises of God and watch God do what we can't even think or imagine. 
that right now God is putting things in place to literally blow your mind on Tuesday and on Wednesday. That when you get to Thursday, you can be reminded that God was already there and preparing something special just for you. So you may have come and you may have an unspoken prayer request, a prayer request that may not made it to the office or not shared it with someone else, but you simply want to say, just, just Pastor Williams, just pray for this particular situation. And we believe, because where two or three are gathered, there God is in the midst. He can do it, and he will do it according to your faith. David's going to come and lead us a song reminding us just simply to trust him. Then Brother Ulysses Petty is going to lead us to the throne of grace. Let's trust him even when we can't trace him, knowing that God is going to do anything but fail. Hallelujah. Let's sing that together. I will be with you. I will. I will be with you. I will be with you. If you will only trust me. Trust me. Trust me. He says, I'll never leave you this morning. I'll never leave you. You will never leave your side. I'll never leave you. If you can count on them to be right there, say, I'll. I'll Trust me. Trust me. Come on, let's say that favorite part right there. I'll fight your battle. I'll fight your battle. Whatever battle you need him to fight for you. I'll fight your battle. Come on, the Lord and his army will fight your battle. the throne of grace. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your holy and precious name. Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. First of all, just saying thank you, Father. We see all of the calamities and the things that are going on in this world, Father, and you spared us and we say thank you. Father, we didn't know that the enemy was attacking us, Father, and you kept them at bay, so we say thank you. For all the many things that you have done for us, Father, the things that we can't even count for, we say thank you. Because if we had 10,000 tons, it would surely not be enough. And so we thank you right now. Father, we come before your throne, not demanding anything, but coming boldly because you told us to come boldly before your throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy. And so, Father, right now we're asking for mercy. Father, we know that there are some who are bereaving right now because they are laying loved ones to rest. But Father, we know that this is not the end. Father, you told us that it did not do weary and well-doing, but we will, we will reap our harvest if we just not faint. And Father, one day we know we will see them on the sea of glass. So Father, we ask in the name of Jesus right now that you will give comfort. You will give strength to those who are grieving right now, Father. Help them to, to have faith and not faint, Father, but trust in you. Father, we know some are sick right now, Father. But you are the great physician, and we ask that you would heal them. 
Restore to them a reasonable portion of health and strength. That they may be able to not only just, just get up and do whatever they used to do, but Father, they will give you all the honor and glory. And those who may be onlookers, Father, will see what you have done for them and may it bring them closer to you. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus right now, Father, that you just continue to bless all of the unsaid requests right now. You know the, the, the things that are on our hearts right now, Father, in the book of Isaiah tells us that you knew them before we even asked for these prayers right now. So, Father, go before us and grant these petitions. And, Father, right now, we just claim the promises um, of you, that you will be with us, Father, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. Help these things to dwell in our hearts right now we, as we move throughout these days, Father, and understand that though these days may be evil, Father, we know they're coming to an end. Let us hold fast to your faith. Let us hold fast to your promises. Let us hold fast to you. Continue to bless us all, Father, in every individual way. Thank you, Father, for those who gave their life to you today. We know now that the enemy will be after them even more than they were before. We ask in the name of Jesus to help them to rely on you. Let them know that you are sufficient enough to cover everything that they are going through. And let us be here as a family, Father, to support them and put our arms around them, Father, and help them make it through. And, Father, for the rest of this service, we ask that you continue to bless us and that everything be done in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your eyesight. And we thank you when we ask that you help us to hold fast and just continue to look forward to your son who will one day crack the sky and come and receive us into his own. For it is in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we sincerely, humbly, and earnestly pray this prayer. And let all under the sound of my voice say, Amen. We can open up and say, I am. not time for our offering time, but of course, I would like to tell a little story first. So um, there's a story about an, an older lady, right? This is like years ago. Um, so the lady, and she took out her tithes and offering, and it came to a dollar and 60 cent. Um, so throughout the week, you know, she had to wait until Sabbath to give the tithes and offering, uh, to give the tithes to God. So um, what happened was throughout the week, uh, Monday came, right? 
and she found that she needed some laundry detergent, correct? So she said, surely God would allow me to take this dollar and 60 cent and go buy the laundry detergent, correct? But as she began to do so, she remembered that, no, this is God's money. And so she took the money, she put it back on her dresser, and as soon as she put the money back on her dresser, she heard a knock on the door. Knock on the door was a salesperson that was selling what? Laundry detergent. And he gave her a big gallon of detergent. The next day, that Tuesday, um, kids came over, the neighborhood kids came over, and she said that she wanted to feed them. But she had, at the time, it was like a gas stove, and she had uh, no matches to, to start the stove. And so um, she said, well, surely God will allow me to take this money and go buy matches to cook. And she began to take the money. She said, well, this is God's money. I can't do that. As she was putting the money again back on her dresser, a neighbor came by, and they sat and they talked. And as they were talking at the kitchen table, he was flicking with matches back and forth. And as she, he was flicking with matches, matches fell on the floor. And when the neighbor left, she picked up all the matches that fell on the floor, and she could use those to cook. She began to praise God. Wednesday came along. Her kids were hungry. And she said, well, surely God would let me go and, and, and buy some milk from the store so I can feed them. But as soon as she got ready to get the money, she said, I can't do that. This is God's money. And so what happened was uh, she put the money back on her dresser. And as she began to put the money back on the dresser, her daughter came by and said, Mom, we got uh, a bunch of food and milk from our grocery store that that we can't sell anymore because it's not expired, but it's, it's a sale day and we got to give this away. So we're going to give it to you instead. And she said, praise God. The moral of the story is if we are faithful to God, God will be faithful to us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we give you, as we return um, this money that is rightfully yours, we ask that you will use it to carry this gospel and so that others can be saved in Jesus name. That's constantly changing. It's a blessing and a comfort to know that God is still in control and that He is still touching the lives of people everywhere. Here at the Oakwood University Church, we are committed to reaching all people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to the needs in our community and beyond. We work diligently to ensure that you are blessed through our preaching, teaching, music, children's, youth, and community ministries. We praise God that we have been able to provide weekly food giveaways, COVID-19 testing and vaccinations, help during disasters, health services through the Oakwood University Church Health Services Center, healthy food alternatives, through our Oakwood University Church Market, our online support through Grief Share and Divorce Care Ministries, and daily prayer through our prayer ministry, just to name a few. But there is so much more that God is calling us to do, and we need your help. As people return to worship in person, with your prayers and support, we can continue to create additional online content to reach people with the good news and cover the production costs associated with providing a quality, meaningful, virtual worship experience. Please know that you can faithfully return your tithe and combine budget offerings in several ways. You can give in person by visiting our church office on Mondays through Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Or you can mail your gifts to the church at 5500 Adventist Boulevard, Northwest, Huntsville, Alabama, 35896. You can share your gifts online through our church website at www.oucsda.org forward slash donate. Or you can cash app us by utilizing our cash app handle dollar sign O-U-C S-D-A. You can also use the Adventist Giving app and donate under Oakwood University Church. May God continue to bless you as we engage in meaningful 
relevant and life-changing ministry. from Buffalo, New York. Welcome to Oak Town Live. Next up, I'm Lucy. Hi kids, I'm Brother Ida K. And I'm the Oak Town News Team. Uh, now, I only have uh, just one announcement. Uh, get your videos in. Uh, is the slide up? Uh, uh, is my mic off? <laughs> Cause I'm looking at this script. I, I don't have that many lines. I, I don't know why that is. Oh, my mic was never turned off. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, well, that's all for now. Next up, one of our neighbors singing the Oak Town song. And remember, Oak Town is indeed uh, the place to be. Uh, even if uh, that was a little embarrassing uh, to me. <laughs> Oaktown is the place for me, cause Jesus died and set me free. It's where I grow in Christ and be. Oaktown come and go. Oaktown is the place for me, cause Jesus died and set me free. It's where I grow in Christ and be. Oaktown come and go. Oaktown come and go, come to Jesus. Oaktown come and go, go for Jesus. Oaktown come and go. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Pastor Raphael, and welcome to Oak Town Live, where we come to know Jesus and go to... <laughs> That's right, live Jesus. Well, let's see. We had Gracie from New York to do our welcome, Brother Ida did the news, and we had Nia from Texas to do our Oak Town song. Didn't they all do an awesome job? They really did. Let's put our hands together for them. Well, next we will have our announcements, some children's videos, and then our children's story. In celebration of Black History Month, Mrs. Raphael decorated our Oaktown Welcome Center with a balloon wall that is in the colors that represent our African American heritage. And she did an awesome job. Let's thank her by putting our hands together. Beautiful job, Mrs. Raphael, and happy Valentine, my love. Well, next we will have our quiz master, Adam. Hi, kids, I'm Adam. And the last time I was on, I gave you an assignment to find a time or event when Dr. Martin Luther King said the Lord's Prayer. And the answer is, Dr. King said the Lord's Prayer July 18, 1957, while praying at a Billy Graham who stayed in New York. And now I'm happy to announce five scholarly researchers. And their names are Delia, Samara, Rain, Sage and Rahema, congratulations! You will get your gift through email this coming week. Well, that's all for now. Bye! Oh, and I almost forgot. Happy Valentine's Day, Mom. I love you. Well, kids, now it's time to see who registered in Oaktown has a birthday today or who will have a birthday by Friday. Marley, Nia Michelle, Avery, David, Ayana, Chillian, Holland, Jaden, Caden, Maddie, Malachi, Joseph, Samara, Andrea Rose, Ava, Emma, Kenneth, Latara, Gianna, Rain. God has blessed you with one more happy birthday. God has blessed you with another one. Well, it's time for our giveaway for children registered in Oaktown. So let's see who I will pick today. And I picked 
Savannah C. Congratulations, you will get your gift by email this coming week. Hello, my name is Akosia Grace. My Black History family member is my mother, Ruth Antonio Lindsay. She was born in Ghana, Africa and attended school in Batona. When she was young, she knew she wanted to be in the medical field and help people. She came to the United States at 21 years old to advance her education. She's the first nurse practitioner in her family. My mom is per passionate about providing quality medical care to those less fortunate. My mom is my hero. Today, we're going to continue our story about Ruth. Now, you might be wondering, why did I pick Ruth's story to share during Black History Month? I picked Ruth because Ruth has a lot in common with a lot of people, maybe even you. Ruth was born in a state next door to some of us. She was born in Mississippi. Any of you from Mississippi or a family from Mississippi or live in a state next door to Mississippi? See, I told you she's like some of us. Ruth had a big family. Do you have a big family? Ruth was a pastor's child. How many pastor's children out there? Ruth lost her father when she was young. Have you lost a parent? Ruth was born into a poor family. Do you know anyone like that? Okay, here's some more things about Ruth. Ruth grew up in Los Angeles. How many of you live in or near Los Angeles or your family's from California? I'm raising my hand too on that one. Well, just a few more things you might have in common with Ruth. Here's one obvious and awesome one. Ruth was a girl, a female. All girls or ladies, please raise your hand. No, in fact, please stand up. Let's put our hands together for all girls and ladies and women in this place and across the world. Praise God, you may be seated. And while you're being seated, I just want to say that a girl, or I should say teen, produced this hoodie, and I love it. Her name is Janaya Hines, and she has her own business, Slay It Proud. Thank you, Janiah. So many of us have something in common with Ruth, who was also a businesswoman. And that's why I picked Ruth for Black History Month. But there's something you may or may not have in common with Ruth someday. When Ruth grew up and was old enough to get married and old enough to think about it, she decided she loved her work and God so much, she was okay if she never found her Valentine or got married. Well, how many of you think she found her Valentine and got married? How many of you think, no, she didn't find her Valentine or get married? Well, one day, a friend introduced her to someone very kind and helpful like her. And though she basically thought she would never have a Valentine, this man she met didn't give up easily, and soon they were married and began a great work for people together, which we will talk about next week. But let's end with this scripture that reminds me of Ruth and the path she took. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Someday, or maybe even now, you will start a great work. And while you could do it on your own like Ruth could have, like the scripture says, it may be easier if you have someone to help. How many of you have a good friend or someone you think might become a good friend? Well, take care of your friendships. That person may help you someday or maybe even now. Now, speaking of friendships, I have some little friends, well, they're not so little, and I hope to get the know to know them better. They are the Dudbots, Ace, Aubrey, and Avery, and they're going to help me out and help us out by singing the first verse of the Black National Anthem just before we pray. So let's listen and sing along.
Aren't they amazing? Let's put our hands together for them again. Thank you, DeadBots. Let's pray. Dear Father, please help us to march on till victory is won by making great friendships with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's give Sister Bowden another hearty amen today. We praise God for her ministry and song. If, if God has been good, why don't you say amen one more time? If he's been real good, you ought to shout hallelujah. If you love him, say thank you, Jesus. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, giving his name the praise that he deserves. The Bible says that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, that the name of the Lord is to be praised. And I'm excited once again to be able to worship the true and living God in spirit and in truth on this is holy Sabbath day. Can you say amen? Uh, we again are very excited for the opportunity to be able to gather together in person and we extend the welcome to those who are gathered to join with us online. And before we go, I just want to just take a moment to just ask for you to just give a hearty amen for everybody that served here at the campus today, every media person, every deacon, children's ministry, ushers, nurses, everybody that got up early, that stayed up late so that we could make sure the gospel got to somebody's living room today. We thank God for you, your ministry, your service, and your sacrifice. Uh, again, we're excited this month to be celebrating Black History Month. God has been good to us as a people. What do you say? And so our theme for the month is reigniting the movement. And each week we have a particular point of emphasis. And today we're going to be celebrating black love and black family. Can you say amen today? And so we want you to know that there is a host of blessings in store for you. At the end of service today, when you go home, we want you to get settled in front of your computer because we have a virtual family conference. Now, last week we started at 2.30, which was a little bit early. So we're going to give you a little bit more time. We're going to start at 3 p.m. Can you say amen? And so we want you to know that we have a number of great presentations for our married couples, our very own doctors, Malcolm and Nicole Taylor, going to talk about the subject lost in translation, going to be talking about communication in marriage. My lovely wife, Gianna, is going to be leading a presentation for the wives called The Power of a Praying Wife. And I'm standing here as a testimony that there is nothing that can hold up like a brother, that can hold up a brother like a praying woman. Can you say amen? And so I want you to know that's going to be a great time. Pastor Mark Raphael is going to be talking about how we can build our family chapels. Pastor Toussaint Williams is going to be talking and making the case for Christian education and how Christian education impacts and betters our families. Doctors Elaine and Willie Oliver are going to be talking to our families about surviving and thriving in your marriage during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want you to know for those who are not married or those who are in waiting, we haven't forgotten about you. I want you to know that Pastor Edsel and Nyasha Cadet from Northeastern Conference are going to lead a presentation called Love Worth Waiting For. Um, our sister Danita Jones is going to be talking to our singles about embracing the process. Our very own Dr. Donna Scott is going to be talking about how grief affects the, affects the black community. I know that there are some of us that are mourning immediately. There are some of us that have been mourning for quite some time, and there are some steps that are going to help us navigate that landscape. And then uh, Ms. Camille Williams is going to be talking on the subject, Navigating Divorce. I'm going to be talking about how divorce affects the black community. And so I want to encourage you to make sure that you log on immediately after service on our advertisement there. The Zoom information is right there. And so we want you to know we do cap out at a thousand people, at a thousand people. So I want to encourage you to make sure that you log on as quickly as you can. Lastly, before we go to the word, we want to ask that you would keep some individuals and some families in our prayers. Many of us are aware that a little over a week ago, Brother Eugene Harris took his rest in Jesus Christ. His funeral is going to be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Had a chance to visit with the family last night. They are in good spirits, but we ask that you would continue to keep them in your prayers. Also, we ask that you would continue to keep in prayer the family of Sister Miriam McMillan. Her funeral service is going to be here at the Oakwood Church this coming Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. And so uh, those who are able to come and and, and, and support and show your love. That's going to be this Thursday at 1 p.m. And also we ask that you would continue to keep the family of Sister Lakeisha Gustav in your prayers. Her funeral service is going to be next Sunday here at the University Church at 11 a.m. Um, there is much sadness and much grief amongst us, but I believe that there is a certain lift that God's people get when we pray when we encourage and we reach out as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. If you, don't, if you believe that, let me hear you say amen. 
At this time, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the Word of God today. I want to invite you to stand with me to your feet as we go to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. The book of Ruth, chapter 1, and we're going to begin at verse 1, and we're going to read a good bit this morning. Ruth, chapter 1, and verse 1. When you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm ready. Ruth, chapter 1, and verse 1. And I must say, y'all look mighty good in the house of the Lord today. It's good. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. Turn to your neighbor. Just let them know, you look pretty good today. Amen. Turn to your other neighbor and say, yeah, you, you look good too. Amen. If you're at home, turn to your wife or your husband and tell them you look good today. May still have the hair, hair net on, but it's okay. They still look good. Amen. Ruth chapter 1. And verse number one, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the women survived, and her two sons survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go, Return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are, still, are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, and go, for I am too old to have a husband. If should I have hope, if should I have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you, nor go back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened that when they had come to Bethlehem, that all of the city was excited because of them. And the women said that this is Naomi. And again, I just want to read for emphasis verse number, uh, number four, three. The Bible says, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of the one Orpah, the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt there 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. 
So the women survived her two sons and her husband. Today, saints, I want to talk to you for a little while under the subject, it never goes like you planned it. It never goes like you planned it. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that in this little while that you would say much. And Father, as we look at love in the context of loss and trial and adversity, I'm praying that you would multiply our faith in the hearing of the word. And once again, I need your strength to be made perfect in my human weakness. So Lord, would you please once again hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We pray this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let God's people say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, it never goes quite like you planned it. You know, saints, if you were to stop by my home on a Thursday evening or sometimes a Saturday night, you would see me and my kids engaged in a highly tense competitive battle in a game of Uno. And I like to think that I'm the king of Uno in my house, but it's not saying much because when I'm playing against the kids, the battle is pretty much won as soon as the cards are dealt. In other words, my oldest son can't win because he's so busy complaining about the cards that he didn't get that he doesn't know how to play the cards that is in his hand. My, my daughter can't win because even when she gets a good hand, she's so busy looking in everybody else's hand that she doesn't know how to use what's been given to her. My youngest son doesn't win because even when he's given a good hand, he doesn't know what to do with it. He can have all draw fours and still lose because he doesn't know how to play even when he's been given a good hand. But the reason I tend to win against them is that my game is not predicated upon the cards that I receive. I'm not worried about the cards in my hand. I'm just going to play the cards that I've been dealt. And I don't know about you, saints, have you ever met somebody in life that's been given a good hand, but they don't know how to use it? In fact, there are some of us relationally that have been given a good hand. You've been given good parents. You actually have a good man. You've got a good woman. Your problem is you don't know how to work the good hand you've been given. And then there are some of us that have been given a good hand, but you're so busy looking at somebody else's hand that you can't appreciate what you've been given. You're so busy looking at their life and mimicking their life that you don't have appreciation for the hand that you have. But then there are some of us that don't make progress because they're so busy blaming the dealer for what they did not get. In other words, there are some of us that are so mad about the advantage that you didn't get or the opportunity that you did not receive that you can't play uh, the hands that are in uh, available unto you. And see, how many of us understand that in the game of Uno, it's not necessarily about the advantage cards. As long as you have every color, you've got a card to play. In other words, as long as I got a color, I'm good to go. In other words, I'm straight with green because green represents his provision. The gold represents his majesty. The blue represents his royalty. And I love red cards because they remind me that I'm covered by the blood. And how many of us know today, friends, that the dealer doesn't determine who wins the game. The one who wins is the one that works with the hand they've been given. And do I have at least seven Uno saints in the room today that are not going to spend time complaining about your cards. You're not going to spend life looking at somebody else's hand. You're going to learn how to thank God for the cards that you have and you're going to do the best with what you've been given because life never goes like you planned it. Can the church say amen? 
And so go back with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. And I want us to understand today, friends, that the story of Naomi and Ruth, it teaches us several things. But the first thing this story teaches us is that sometimes God allows famine even in promised land. Uh, Let me say this, the first thing it teaches is that sometimes God allows famine even in promised land. Now, this is a very interesting story because here we find Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons that are leaving the city of Bethlehem, which is in the heart of Canaan because of the famine that has arisen. And I need you to get that Canaan is the promised land that God swore unto Abraham through a covenant. In other words, this is the land that was promised to the descendants of Abraham. This is the terrain that they marched for under Moses and they fought to occupy under Joshua. And remember, saints, that Canaan was the land that was flowing with milk and honey. Remember when the 12 spies brought samples from the vineyards in Canaan, they showed that they had grapes the size of golf balls awaiting those who would ultimately inherit the land. And I need you to know that Canaan was good when they first entered in. In other words, Canaan was all that when they first crossed over. Canaan was perfect when they were in the honeymoon phase. In other words, saints, when they were in the honeymoon phase of Canaan, everybody was happy. When they were in the honeymoon phase, everyone was satisfied. When they were in the honeymoon phase, the land was fertile, the harvest was abundant, and everything flourished in the honeymoon phase. But the longer they stayed in the land of covenant, things changed. After they had been in the promise a little while, things began to shift. And in other words, after they had been in the promised land a little while, and after the honeymoon began to wear off, after a while, the land that was liberal became stingy and stubborn. After the honeymoon wore off, the land became much harder to manage. After the honeymoon wore off, the land that had so much promise seemed to turn against them in a negative way. And what they learn, friends of mine, is that sometimes God even allows famine in promised land. In other words, married folks, stay with me. See, they didn't think that being in the land of promise would be this hard. They didn't think that they would work this much in the land of covenant. They they didn't think that being in the covenant space would be this challenging and understand that there is a disillusionment that is beginning to emerge in the lives of those who dwell in the land of promise because in their minds, if God is with us, it wouldn't be this hard in covenant terrain. If God was still with us, it wouldn't be this scarce in promised land. They are at a place where they can't believe that we fought just for this and we prayed for this and we marched for this and their willingness to leave the promised land reflects our willingness to leave the covenant of marriage as soon as a little famine shows up. You see, friends of mine, we have a family trying to leave the land of covenant. Here, we have a family that wants to abandon covenant terrain because they didn't anticipate it being this hard. In other words, in their minds, being in covenant territory shouldn't be this stressful. But how many married folk can testify today that every now and then God allows a little famine even in promised land? And see, I say this, beloved, so that some of us can begin to modify some of our expectations. Let me just say to all of my single friends, let me forward this message to you today. Be careful about being in such a hurry to enter into the promised land. Be careful about rushing into the land of covenant. Be hurry, don't be in a hurry to cross over because I need you to know that God even allows famine in promised land. 
In, in other words, single folk, I need you to understand, saints, that getting married doesn't solve problems. All getting married does is make your problems permanent. Y'all might be quiet with me today. Uh, I need you to know, folk, that when you're single, you got an advantage when it gets hard. Because when you're single, you can unfollow, you can unfriend, you can go back to your own house. But guess what? Once you say, I do, you got to wake up with it. You got to go to sleep next to it. You got to eat with it each and every day of your life. In other words, it don't make things go away. It just makes certain problems permanent. Am I telling the truth today? And see, the thing I need somebody to get is that sometimes we get deceived by the promises of marriage and promised land. We get deceived by the milk and honey promises. We get deceived by the rolling hill of Canaan covenants that sometimes we forget that sometimes there's going to be famine allowed even in promised land. And see, I need us to understand, beloved, that famine is usually the result of drought or enemy raid. In other words, during a famine, living things die. During a famine, fertile things begin to dry up. But the thing I need you to get about famine, the deception of famine is that famine is permanent. No, let me say it again. See, the deception of famine is that a famine is permanent, but how many of us know that a famine is seasonal? Oh, I wish I had a church with me today. In other words, I need you to know that there are going to be some, some seasons of famine in life. There are going to be times where in marriage we go through some emotional famine, where there is a disconnect, where we're simply not on the same page. There are going to be times where there is romantic famine, where good feeling gets smothered by the monotonies and the stresses of life. Is there anyone, anyone that's gone through a financial famine where you are so broke that you you could not pay attention. At times, there's going to be a sexual famine. In fact, some of us are in a sexual Sahara this afternoon. But I need us to understand that even though there are going to be seasons of famine, I need you to know that famine is always passing. It's not permanent. And see, the thing the devil wants you to believe is that the famine is permanent and God's goodness is seasonal. But how many of us know the devil is a lie? The goodness of God is permanent and that the famine is passing. And what I need somebody to do is not make a permanent decision based upon a seasonal circumstance. I want you to know that just because it looks bad today, it won't always look look bad forever. I want somebody to know that after a while, you got to get to a place where you function out of the forecast and not out of your outlook. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? Okay, okay, let me say it this way. I, I remember a few years back, I was getting ready, my wife and I, to take our kids camping with the Pathfinders one weekend. And I remember that particular week, it rained like it did in the time of Noah. It rained all Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and it seemed as if it rained without stop. And I remember that Wednesday or Thursday, my kids were discouraged, and they said, Daddy, we're mad because we're not going to get to go camping this weekend. And I said, why do y'all think that the trip has been canceled? They said, look out of the window, Daddy. It has been raining every day since Sunday. And so that evening, what we did was we turned on the news and we allowed them to see the week forecast. And I need you to know that even though it was raining on Thursday, guess what? There was sunshine in the forecast on Friday and Saturday. And what I had to let them know is that you don't make your your plans based on the outlook. You got to learn how to make your plans on the forecast. And what I'm saying to somebody today is I know the outlook looks bad today, but is there anybody that knows that there is joy in the forecast? There is peace in the forecast. There is healing in the forecast. Don't function based on how it looks today. You've got to trust God for what he promised on tomorrow. Are you hearing the word today? The second thing this story teaches friends of mine is that sometimes what you run to can be worse than the thing you're running from. 
Help me, Lord. Give, give me, saints, a little latitude as I make the case today. Have you all ever noticed in the story of Naomi and her husband that they literally leave the promised land and go to the land of Moab to escape famine and the potential for death? But isn't it ironic that they leave the land of promise to escape death, and when they get to Moab, her man dies, both of her sons die, and even though it seemed unbearable in promised land, they actually jump out of the frying pan, oh, y'all not hearing me today, and into the fire. And what I'm saying is the thing that they ran to was actually worse than the space they were running from. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? And see, this is interesting because the folk that, that, that when Naomi actually goes back to Bethlehem, did you notice that the folk that knew her when she left were still there when she came back home? Which meant it would have been better to struggle with God in promised land than to go into the country of Moab where they had no divine covering. And, and it's crazy because if they had stayed in the promised land, they would have been better than if they had left the land of covenant. Y'all mighty quiet with me today. See, I need you to understand that even in this story, there is theological conflict as to what caused the husband and the boys to die. Some believe that they died as a result of famine there in the land of Moab, but the Bible does not give us a cause of death. But the one consensus is that leaving Canaan was an act of unbelief. And I need you to get, saints, that when they leave Canaan, they participate in a trend in Scripture that has the same negative consequences. What do you mean, Pastor? You remember God promised Abraham the land of Canaan. And remember, Abraham actually went into Canaan. But then there was famine early on, and he went down into Egypt, and he told a lie so severe that it almost compromised Sarah. Remember the sons of Jacob left the land of Canaan and went to live in Egypt because there was a famine there and they stayed in Egypt so long that they one day wound up slaves of a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And even when Naomi leaves the promised land, he loses everything she loves and everyone she knows because I need you to get that bad things happen whenever you leave the promised land. And I need y'all to get this, saints, because leaving didn't make things better. Leaving actually made things worse. And see, I want to just preach for a moment to that family that is on the verge of leaving covenant because what Naomi would tell you if she was preaching this sermon today, she would tell you it would be better to struggle in covenant terrain than to seek deliverance in the land of Moab. And see, I want to just talk to anybody, no matter what your relationship status is, I want to encourage you to know that it's better to struggle in covenant with God than to step out on your own without God. In other words, sisters, I know it's hard staying married to him, but I need you to get that sometimes what you run to might be worse than what you're running from. Uh, I can't get no help from me today. In other words, it's hard being married to that brother now, but if you thought it wasn't no good men in the church in your 20s, try stepping into the dating scene when you're in your 50s. Come on, the pickings get real slim at that age. Am I telling the truth to somebody today? In other words, I need you to know you don't want to be the 52-year-old sister at happy hour. Come on and say amen today. Well, even the brothers your age, they looking at the women in their 30s. Come on and say amen and shame the devil in this. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, saints? 
I, I need you to understand that sometimes what you run to can be worse than what you're running from. I, I need some young person to understand. I know it's hard being in the covenant of celibacy. I know it's hard. Everybody else is doing it. But what you're finding out is that even though it seems easier to say, I'm just going to lay down tonight and ask for forgiveness tomorrow, what you're learning is that when you come out of covenant, life gets more complicated, it gets more messy, and even more unsatisfying. I need you to know that you can't enjoy it until you're in a committed relationship. I know dating someone that is equally yoked is a hard covenant to abide in, but I need you to know that when you settle for somebody that doesn't know God, and you got to carry him and yourself spiritually, and you got to wake him up for church, and you got to force him to have worship, and you got to get him to try to pray. You're going to wish you had waited in the land of covenant. And what I'm saying to somebody today, staying in covenant land is hard, but I would rather stay in covenant with God than to go shopping in the land of Moab. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, saints? And I need you to get that Moab represents life outside of the covenant. It represents the easy way out. But what Naomi finds the hard way is that Moab makes promises that it cannot fulfill. It, it, it is false advertising. It promises deliverance. It promises relief. And what I'm saying to some couple, and let me just say this. I'm not saying this to bash or condemn anybody that has been divorced. That is not the objective. But what I need somebody to understand that divorce is not a healing process. That there is no deliverance. I need you to know that the road you take can sometimes be harder than the road you're on. Sometimes you jump out of the frying pan and right into the fire. And how many of us have ever had the opportunity to, to cook an egg in the frying pan? See, how many of us know that in the frying pan, the heat transforms? Oh, where y'all at? In other words, if I put the raw egg in the frying pan, what it's going to do, it's going to transform the egg. It's going to transform its texture. It's going to transform its makeup. It's going to transform its sustenance. But if I take it out of the frying pan and put it right into the fire, the frying pan is going to transform, but the fire is going to consume. Where y'all at today, church? How many of us know you better stay in the frying pan of affliction where God is going to grow you. God is going to transform you. God is going to make you over. But sometimes when you step out of the pan, you'll get consumed by the weight of the fire. And see, I need y'all to get this, saints, because somehow in our time, staying married has become a controversial position to take. But did you notice what the Bible says in verse 6? The Bible says in verse 6, watch this, that the Lord visited his people with bread. Oh, we all at church. No, no, the word says that when they was running out of the promised land, God had a date of deliverance. God had a day of provision. That God had set a day when he was going to change things. God had already a plan to end the famine. But they were so busy running from the famine that they forfeited the miracle because they left the promised land too soon. And what I'm saying to us today, the famine may be severe, but how many of us know that God has a day that he's going to end the famine in your life? He's going to end the financial famine. He's going to end the emotional famine. That God has got a day that he's going to send bread, but don't abandon the miracle too soon. Ooh. See, you, you, you realize that those who remain, that's a hard thing. When you see your cabinet and your pantry get down to the last slice of bread. They see in the pantry, the bottle get down to the last drop of oil. Somebody on that last day gets their last piece of fish. But because they abode in promised land, right when they got down to nothing, 
they found out that God was still up to something. And what I need somebody to know today is that it's hard to winter in this terrain, but sometimes it's when you get down to nothing that you find out that God was still up to something, but don't forfeit the miracle prematurely. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, saints? Listen, man, I remember one day, man, I was in my old church office and, and the kids were with me hanging out for the day and, you know, I was going to go upstairs and get them some snacks and, and there was some, some little stale stuff that was in the office already, but I told them I'm going to go get y'all some snacks. All three of y'all, y'all just hang here and I'll be back with something good for y'all. But there was some little stale potato chips that was already there and I guess I took too long to come back. Now, I need you to know that I got two boys and a girl. Now, I need you to know that these boys, you know how they are, they ain't going to wait for nothing. And so what the boys do is they just go ahead and they eat the stale potato chips. But then when I come back with Dunkin' Donuts, they already full and their appetite is spoiled because they couldn't wait for what I told them was coming. But guess what? My baby girl sat there and didn't touch nothing. She waited based on the word that was spoken. Now, I think I need you to get is this. Not only does she get what I got for her, I was able to give her the boy's portion because she was willing to wait on what daddy said. Y'all not hearing me today. And what I'm saying is sometimes you forfeit the provision if you don't wait on what daddy said. And how many of us know why some people get a double portion? Some people get a double portion because they get the portion that God brought for those who were too impatient to wait on him. Oh, y'all not hearing me today, saints. And how many of us know that God is going to give you double for your trouble if you learn to wait on his holy word? Are you hearing the word, saints? So the word says here in verse number 16, the Bible says, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Third thing this teaches us, beloved, is the power of a family witness. So, so Naomi and her husband, they move into the land of Moab. As the boys grow into young adult life, they marry more by women because that's all they actually have to choose from. But one of the things that I think is powerful about this story is that after the husbands and the boys die, Naomi actually thinking that she is doing them a favor, says, listen, ladies, y'all need to go and make the most of your life while you're still young. You need to contemplate getting remarried to someone else. I don't want to drag you down the road that I am on. I need you to go back to your people where you will have an opportunity to start over now, understand that when most folk get a chance to get away from their mother-in-law, <laughs> most people see that as a good opportunity. But I need you to get that Naomi had such an attractive Christian character that her unbelieving daughters-in-law wanted to follow after her even after their husbands had died and gone to sleep. It's amazing how Naomi literally has to try to push them away. And it's amazing how Ruth is ultimately decides that she's just going to roll with Naomi wherever she goes. She gets up in Naomi's face and it's just like, listen, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Your people are going to be my people and your God is going to be my God. Some of y'all missed your shout already. Do you realize that Naomi's witness was so strong over her daughter-in-laws that the daughter-in-laws wanted to mimic her habits. They wanted to follow her customs. They wanted to adopt her lifestyle. And then they wanted to serve her God. See, the thing I like about Naomi is that Naomi is not condescending because she's got the truth. 
You see, the thing I like about Naomi is that she doesn't, she doesn't condemn them because they eat bacon. She does not beat them up with doctrine. She does not wear them out because they take mass instead of communion. She does not look down on them because they worship on the wrong day. What she simply does is loves them with the love of Jesus Christ. And it is the love that awakens a willingness to follow her tradition. And I need us to get this, that like us, it's not, it wasn't the ideal situation for Naomi. This was not her preference. Her preference would have been for her, her sons to marry uh, uh, spiritual uh, Hebrew women so that the godly heritage would ultimately be able to be preserved. But once they get married and the boys make up their mind, she stops her protest and counsel and just loves them with the love of God. Are you with me today, saints? Now, don't, hear, don't mishear me on this because I think it's appropriate for you to want your children to marry inside of the church, to want your siblings to marry inside of the faith. It is appropriate for you to want your grandchildren to be equally yoked so that you can continue a godly lineage and a godly heritage. But how many of us know that once they get engaged or decide to get married, you got to stop your protests. And you've got to start loving them with the love of Jesus. I, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Like, like how many of us real talk, you know you can't make grown people do nothing they don't want to do. And, and the truth is that if you are raising kids that are rebelling against you, you realize the more you try to break them up, you actually create the adhesive that makes them stay closer together. Sometimes instead of trying to break folk up, what you got to simply learn how to do is pray, Lord, let the scales be removed from their eyes. Help them to see what, I, what I'm able to see. And, and see, if they choose not to then be able to see, what you got to simply do is attack and bum rush them with the love of Jesus. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? See, when, when, when your child or your grandchild gets engaged or they get married, you know what you got to learn? is at this point, they family now. You can complain about it all day, but that ain't going to change the city. Am I preaching to anybody today? Like, like y'all are related. In other words, at this point, you are obligated to show them the love of Jesus Christ. And see, the problem with us is sometimes we get so twisted in our thinking that we want to always show our contempt for the relationship. We want to show our contempt for their decision. We want to shun them in our religion. We show our displeasure by voicing our doctrine. And what we fail to realize is that you can't shun people to Jesus. See, I need you to get that it is love that conquers all things. It is love that awakens curiosity. It is love that awakens their interest. It is true piety that garners your respect. It is the fruit of your life that makes them want to copy your habits and copy your customs and be open to what you do. And God will bring about the right circumstances to bring about a harvest if you sown seeds of love. But you can't sow seeds of hate and hope to get converted fruits. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? At some point, you got to stand down and let Jesus do the work. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Can we go to the Bible? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. Y'all, can we study the book, the book together? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 11. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse number 11, when you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 11. The Bible says, but even if she does not depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife, but to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the what? Wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the what? 
Husband, otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, if you decide to go down that pattern or if you've been converted after you got married uh, and, and your spouse is not, the Bible literally lets us know that you are not to try to chide that person into the faith. But the Bible literally teaches that through relationship with you, oh God, through relationship with you, you get a covering that is going to allow them to experience the sanctifying power of God. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? So go with me back in the Word. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. When you get there, say, pass from here. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. Come on, come on, hurry up. 1 <laughs> Peter 3. And number one, my feet are burning. Help me, Holy Spirit. First Peter 3 and verse 1, when you get that, say amen. The Bible says, likewise, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the what? Word. They without a word. Did y'all catch that, saints? Oh, are y'all seeing this? The Bible says, they without a word may be won by the conduct oh, of a godly wife. In other words, what's going to win them is not a river of complaints and leaning on them, but authentic godly conduct. Ooh. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on a fine apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. See, the problem is we made this text about wearing jewelry. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is the inner beauty of a converted woman who doesn't have to preach a sermon in order to win a man into the faith. But if she just lives like Jesus and loves like Jesus, if a man leads like Jesus, he ain't got to preach a sermon if he just lives the sermon. Because your witness is not in what you teach. It's in how you love but how you love is what opens the door to what you have to teach. Are y'all hearing the word today, saints? Fourth thing, last thing this teaches us, friends, is it teaches us that when it comes down with our family, we got to live with greater gratitude. You know what Naomi's story, and I'm not going to get through all of this today. You know what Naomi's story teaches us? It teaches us, friends of mine, you, oh, help me, Holy Spirit, coming down. You better learn how to be more thankful for the family you have while you have them. I believe, friends of mine, we've got to learn to abide with one another with a lot more gratitude and a lot less scrutiny. See, the reason we don't have gratitude about our family is because we assume wrongly that we're going to always have them. I'm not guessing when I tell you that Naomi did not see her life unfolding in the way that it did. If you had talked to Naomi as a young woman and she had shared with you the way she scripted out her life, just like young people sometimes do, she had probably scripted out a scenario where she and her husband would grow old in the city of Bethlehem. She could foresee a day where she would see her children grow up, that she would see her grandchildren grow up. And even in an end-of-life scenario, she could see her and Elimelech buying a tomb right there in the heart of the promise 
promised land, that she would see her children at her graveside, lowering her down into the grave. But understand, she could never foresee a day of having to bury her husband in a land that was not their own. She would never foresee a time where life would be so radically inverted that instead of the children burying the parent, that the parent would have to lower both kids down into the ground. She would have never seen herself going back to Bethlehem with only the clothes on her back without a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. See, what Naomi teaches us is that life never goes like you planned it. And I need somebody to understand fundamentally that there is an impenetrable veil between the present and the future and it is unveiled one second at a time and the only one that has stood on the other side of the present is Jesus Christ himself and the thing I need somebody to get the reason we ought not walk around assuming that we've got tomorrow thinking we can do stuff later on down the line if being Adventist ought to teach you one thing is that tomorrow ain't promised to no one it's why we let the sun go down on our wrath. It's why we let so many things go without being said. It's why we're so slow to apologize. It's why it takes us so long to pick up the phone and be reconciled. It's why the only time we get together is at a funeral or a wedding. It's the reason we allow family drama to go unaddressed for years and years and years. Why? Because we assume there's going to always be a day where we can come together and get it right. But one of the devil's greatest deceptions, friends of mine, it is not to get you to drink. It's not to get you to smoke. It's not to get you to shack up. It is to make you believe you got more time than you actually have. And so I believe, friends of mine, that if we're going to function with more gratitude, there's some things we need to learn how to do with each other. Are y'all still with me, church? I believe as you function in your marriage or in your home, you need to learn how to focus on the good. No, 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 no. Let me, let me say this again. Let me preach y'all on this side. If you're going to function with gratitude, learn how to focus on the good that's in your house. See, you, you got a good hand, but you don't know what to do with it. Because you're, so, you're looking with so much scrutiny that you can't even see the good that everybody else sees but you. Pastor Ross, I see this all the time. Isn't it amazing how, how the wife, she'll be married to a man, and he ain't, and listen, it'd be true. He ain't no good. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a dog. He did all this stuff wrong. Didn't have nothing good to say about him while he was alive. But when she's standing at the head of his casket, it's amazing she can talk for an hour of some good things that she would never say while he was still living. And I need you to know that those good traits didn't show up after he died. It, the hurt you had while he was living just kept you from being able to see it. Oh. And what I'm saying is, beloved, if you can find something to good to say about them when they die, you can find something good to say to them while they are still alive. Is there anybody that can make it up in your mind to say, I'm going to live with more gratitude in my house, that I'm not going to spend so much time looking at somebody else's hand. I'm going to be grateful for what God has put in my hand. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? church listen man there, there was a sister I was counseling with her and her husband and she wanted him to be more romantic she said pastor you know he just makes me so sick all he wants to do is go to work and go to church and go home I looked at her a little cross eye and said you better thank God you got a man that wants to go to work where y'all at wants to go to church and ain't sitting up in no club. He like to come home every night. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's learning how to focus on the good. In other words, instead of complaining that he worked so hard, maybe you ought to say, Lord, I thank you. Oh, okay, y'all, okay, okay. 
out of the frying pan. In the, thank God that he works hard. Brothers, instead of complaining that she gained weight, maybe you ought to thank God that she knows how to cook. Come on and say amen. Ah, you ought to thank God for the mother she is. Thank God for the husband he is. Thank God for the children that you have. If you know where your children are right now, you ought to put your hands together and bless the name of the Lord that you can locate where they are. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, brothers? Instead of running around in the strip club making it rain on the woman on the pole, you ought to make it rain on that one that's cooking food in your kitchen. Make it rain on the one that's making up the bed. Make it rain on the one that's raising your kids. Make it rain on the one that wiped the urine off the lip of the toilet seat. You better celebrate the one that God has given you. Are you hearing me today, saints? You better learn how to have some gratitude. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Second thing, if you don't function with gratitude, saints, I want to encourage us to learn how to forgive sooner and apologize quicker. Because you know, one of the things about real love, you know what 1 Corinthians 13 says? says? says, love keeps no record of wrongs. So to the spouse that's keeping score, that ain't godliness. It's crazy. I mean, y'all been married almost 18, you know, be 19 years this year. It's crazy because there, there are fights that, you know, we wasted uh, time and I'm in my side of the house and she's in her side of the house and we mad at each other. And it's crazy because I look back on it and the crazy thing is, Lewis, you know what? I can't even remember what we're fighting about. And if you can't remember what the fight was about, you know what that means? It wasn't that deep in the first place. But you know what we do? We like to draw a line in the stand, stand. and we like to take a stand. <laughs> and you know what's so crazy about us? We'll take a stand on matters of preference, not principle. What is the last principle you took a stand on? You gonna take a stand over Taco Bell versus KFC? That's where you're going to take your stand? Over what show y'all going to watch on TV tonight? That's where you're going to take your stand? You're going to take your stand over what side of the bed to lay on uh, at night when you ain't took no stand over family worship, over your finances, over the education of your kids, over whether or not you're going to come to church, and we take stands over matters of preference. And we let real principle go by the wayside. You know what the, the story of, of Naomi teaches us? You know what we ought to do, friends of mine? We ought to learn in our families to thank God for every tragedy-free day. You ought to thank God for every tragedy-free day in your life. How many of us recognize that we are all one doctor's visit away, one stray bullet, one texting teenager while driving from having your whole life turned upside down. And what I'm saying to this, beloved, is that we've just got to get to a place where we stop sweating the small stuff, where we stop dying over hills that are not Calvary. How many of us know that every battle is not worth fighting, but every day that God wakes you up and you are still in the land of the living, instead of complaining about what's wrong, maybe you ought to just say, Lord, I thank you that you allowed us to experience one more day. Is there anybody that can say, Lord, I thank you? Thank you that my bed didn't become my cooling board. Is there anybody that can say, Lord, I thank you that when I got out of the car last night, I made it safely to my destination. Is there anybody like the old folk that can say, Lord, I thank you for waking me up one more morning. Thank you for allowing me to be clothed in my right mind. Is there anybody that can just say, I'm not going to complain about the day. You're going to wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. 
I will rejoice and be glad in it. Instead of complaining, you had to wake up in the morning. You're going to say from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same that the name of the Lord is to be praised. You realize that it is because of the Lord's mercies that you are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Let Oakwood say, great is thy faithfulness. It is why the Bible says, let everything, let everything. Oh, I see something. Let everything. I see someone, but let everyone that has breath praise ye the Lord. Give him praise. Thank him if there's no cancer. Thank him if there's no lupus. Thank him if there was no miscarriage. Thank you if your husband came home last night. Thank him if your wife made it home from the doctor. Thank him that there is no diagnosis. You've got a reason to praise him. You've got a right to praise him. You've got a responsibility to praise him. It could have been different. The outcome could have been different. But God blocked it. And he would not let it be so. And God is just trying to get us to a place, saints, where we stop functioning our families, all this scrutiny. And like a teacher trying to check or find the wrong answers, but with more gratitude and thanksgiving. Because I need you to understand why you're looking at everybody else's hand. You realize they're across the table looking at your hand and saying they got it pretty good. You know what I learned as a pastor? See, we spend so much time looking at everybody else's life. But if you got to spend one day in their shoes, you would run back to your life like your feet was on fire. But God is just trying to get us to a place where we have a little more gratitude. And instead of complaining and saying what we don't have and indicting the dealer, we just got to learn how to say, Lord, it ain't perfect. Lord, everything's not the ideal. But Lord, I'm just going to say, thank you, Lord, for all you have done for me. Let's praise him with the praise team. And I'm going to come back and ask you to make a decision with Jesus. We know the song is real simple. Tragedies are a commonplace, all kinds of disease. People slipping away, economies down, people can't get enough pay. As for me, I know that all I can say, I want to say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Yeah, says folks without homes, living out in the street. And the drug habits, some say, they just can't beat. We have muggers and robbers. No place seems to be safe. But you've been my protection every step of the way. And I want to say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Hey, hey, it could have been me.
Thank you, Lord. Right now, you're standing to your feet as we prepare to close out this service. Sometimes when you just think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries, hallelujah. Thank you for saving a wretch like me. If you just got a little gratitude in your heart today, put your hands together and just praise him. Give him a praise. Give him a shout of praise. He is worthy. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves our worship today. My appeal today is, is multifaceted. Oakwood, as we begin this journey together, I believe that God is saying something expressly to the church. Because we've reached a time where making a commitment to abide with your covenant has become a controversial decision. But we're going to stand against popular thinking and my prayer is that at Oakwood Church that we can develop a no divorce culture in the body of Christ and let me explain what I mean when I say that this is not to condemn anybody that's had a divorce this is not what that's about it's a simply an acknowledgement and see this is the thing I understand as a pastor is that there are people, when, they, when they're getting ready for that second marriage, that third marriage, or that fourth one, what they won't tell nobody but me is that after all I've gone through, if I had just persevered with the first one, I could have made it work. And when I'm saying to somebody, I know it's hard. I, I know it feels unbearable in promised land, but the same way God had a plan to send bread to the promised land, He's got a date where he's going to turn some things around, but don't forfeit your miracle by jumping out too soon. I'm saying to those who are single, I'm saying be prayerful when you make that call. Don't just jump into it because it don't solve problems. It immortalizes them and it makes it the problem non-negotiable. So I want to pray for the body of Christ today. First, I just want to pray for every husband and wife who is saying, Pastor, I hear the word of God. It's hard in promised land. But I recognize, yeah, God allows famine in promised land. But I realize that his goodness is permanent, but the famine is seasonal. And if you're a married couple, you're head of the house, you're you're, you're the priest, you want to say, Pastor, I'm standing in agreement. I want to invite you to bring your partner on. Come on down to the front. I want to pray a prayer of blessing, a prayer of covering over those who are in covenant in the household of faith today. You're you're saying, we pray, we love the Lord, we we know him, but, but I'm just asking God for additional strength. I'm asking God for additional covering. I'm asking God for a supernatural anointing that will withstand all the supernatural attacks that come against me and mine. We will stand in faith. I'm making a second appeal. You don't have to be married for this one. But you're simply saying, Pastor, I'm I'm not married, but I'm going to stay in covenant with God. In other words, I'm not taking any shortcuts. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to abandon my covenant of celibacy. I'm going to do what God has called me to do, and I'm going to be still. I will move to the left or to the right until I hear a clear word from God. And, and I believe my steps are ordered from God. And if, if you're a young person, you're a young adult, maybe there's just somebody that's waiting on the Lord and you want to say, listen, I need supernatural prayer. I, I need God's covering as I abide in this season of life. You can come too. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for God to bless you. I'm going to pray that God would give you the desires of your heart. I'm praying that because you faithfully wait on him and you bypass the shortcuts, that once you meet the one that God has ordained, that you will enter into a marriage that does not function in scarcity and barrenness, but you will live your days in the overflow because you said, I would rather stay with God in promised land 
than to take the shortcuts over in Moab. Maybe you're in the balcony, you can't come down, but you just want to say, Pastor, I'm with you. Just raise your hand in the air saying, I'm, I'm abiding. I see you, young people. God bless you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Before I pray, see the young brothers coming down. God bless you. Before I pray, I want to make this one last appeal. Maybe there's somebody that simply wants to say, Pastor, I need to make a covenant, but not with a person. My covenant needs to begin with Jesus. I need to begin a journey and a relationship with him. You're, you're saying the covenant that I want to start, it ain't going to begin on Tinder. It's going to begin at the altar. Where, where before you meet a husband, you want to meet the bridegroom. And you want to make it up in your mind today to say, I don't want to go all the way in a committed covenant relationship with Jesus to the tune of saying, I want to be baptized for, for the remission of my sins. I want to go all the way and a walk with him. If that's you here today, whether you're in the balcony or on the floor, you want to signify that decision to go in a covenant with Jesus through baptism. Just raise your hand wherever you are to say, I'm going all the way with him. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. God bless you, my brother. My clerks and my Bible workers got a brother right here that wants to make a decision to follow Jesus. Is there somebody else today that wants to go all the way? God bless you. Just keep that hand up. Somebody's going to come to you. Is there somebody else? You want to go all the way? Say, I want to be in a committed relationship with Jesus Christ. I want my covenant to begin with him. I see my clerks, my, my Bible teachers. I got my brother right here that wants to make that decision. Right there. We can get his information right there. Got another sister right here. God bless you. Is there somebody else today that wants to make that decision to go all the way with Jesus? Somebody else that wants to say yes to his will. Yes to his way. Yes to his direction. God bless you, my friend. Got another brother right here. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Praise God. That's a good decision, brother. There's somebody else. If you're on the floor or on the balcony, you want to say yes. I'm going to pray in just a moment. Maybe you want to be baptized. Maybe you've been away and estranged, estranged from God. You need to be rebaptized or rededicated. Maybe you're watching online uh, and, you, and you, you want to make that same decision to enter into covenant. Just go to connect with us at OUCSDA.org forward slash connect. Uh, uh, click on the appeal card and make that calling and election sure. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't say later. Don't say next week. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. God bless you, brothers. Come on down. Praise God for you. Is there somebody else? You want to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Right now, every head is bowed, eyes closed. We're praying that God would help us to build a no divorce culture, a culture where we train young people to make the good decisions. And we make such heavy deposits into our families where it becomes nearly impossible to walk away from the good hand that you have. And there's no condemnation of those who made a mistake or those who made a divorce. My prayer for you is that God would bless you better the second go round. No condemnation. But I want somebody to understand that what you run, front, run to, it can be worse than what you're running from. Be still. Endure hardness like a good soldier. God is going to bring the famine season to an end. Father in heaven, I come before you as the under shepherd, appealing to you, the good shepherd, on behalf of this which is, they're not my flock, they are yours. And Lord, we, we come standing in the need of prayer because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and a warfare that is not of this world. So Father, I'm praying that right now you would lay on the body of Christ an anointing that is sufficient to withstand the opposition that seeks to rip apart every house under the sound of my voice that seeks to annihilate every home that is represented online. And Father, I want to pray for that family that is in crisis. 
I want to pray for that family that is in trouble, that, that it is in a, 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 a spiritual famine, that is in a relational famine, that is in a financial famine, that is in a medical famine. They do not see any other way besides separation and divorce. Lord, I pray that right now that each husband and wife would renew the covenant, that they would turn their hearts toward one another, and that they would ultimately turn their hearts toward you. And Lord, my prayer is that you would release supernatural power. That you would give power to forgive. That you would give power to accept. That you would allow the offenses to be cast into the sea of forgetfulness. I pray that you would revive love. Revive love that you would revive patience. I'm praying that you would do a new thing. But Lord, help somebody to have enough humility to humble themselves before you and before their spouse. Help us not to think too highly of our own opinions. Help us not to be too determined to have our own way. Help us to not draw a line in the sand over matters of preference, but help us to only stand where there is a biblical principle at work. Lord, I pray for the singles online, for the singles in the room who, who stood there and stood or raised their hands or came down to the front. Father, it's hard. The options are for you. But Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, I pray that they would stay in a covenant saying that they will only pursue those that they can be equally yoked with. Individuals that will help build them spiritually and grow them spiritually and that they will not be an anvil or a weight that will drag them down and separate them from you. Lord, I pray for the young people who are desiring to remain in the covenant of celibacy, realizing that their wholeness is more important than immediate gratification. Lord, I pray that some young person, young, young woman, some middle-aged person, some middle-aged man or woman, that they would not take any shortcuts, that they would wait for Mr. or Mrs. Right, and they would not settle for Mr. or Mrs. Right now. Help them to know that their steps have been ordered, that you have plans to prosper them and not to harm them. I pray for those who are grieving online or in the building because a loved one has fallen asleep Lord, I pray that you would anchor them with the assurance that you are coming again to put an end to sickness and sorrow and to permanently overthrow the power of death. And as you said through your servant, Ellen White, on the day of that great resurrection morning, that you are going to relink the family chain that has been broken. Help them not to be overwhelmed by discouragement, but may your spirit be what you promised it would be. May it be a counselor and a comforter. May it be a helper in the dark and lonely moments. So, Lord, would you cover us no matter what our marital status, married, single, divorced, grieving, whatever we are, wherever we are, would you be what we need? And no matter how hard it gets, may we not abandon our divine covenant. Would you bless us? Would you keep us? Would you help us to be faithful till you come? We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let those who believe say together, amen. Let those who believe shout hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord as we abide in divine covenant with him. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Those who came down or you raise your hand for baptism, would you just follow our Bible instructors? They're going to give you some spiritual direction and some clarity on the path going forward. I'm going to pray for you. For those who came down for baptism or rededication, would you follow them? Has the Lord been good to us today, saints? Amen and amen. Again, we just want to encourage those of you who are, who are online, make sure that you stay by for our Praise Cafe. Got some important things that I need to share with you about what's going to happen this afternoon. But more than that, got some important things that's going to be happening in the next month or so. So hang by after the benediction as we continue in our fellowship in person or online. God bless. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Dear Father, we just want to take this time to say thank you because we don't say it enough. So we want to give you a moment to say thank you. Father, we understand that sometimes our plans don't go as we want them, but we, we thank you that you have the ultimate plan. 
that your plan never fails and never will. Father, we are praying that even though uh, the famines come in the promised land, that you will hold us through the pain. Father, we know that, that sometimes we run from our afflictions, but Father, we, when we go through those hard times and troubles, we are, Father, we are hoping that we draw closer to you, that we run closer to you. Father, we are praying that we be a witness for you, that people will want to know who we know, that people will want to understand the Christ that we serve. Father, we are praying that while we are in our situations, trials, and tribulations, that we can give you thanks, even though it hurts. Father, we are attempting to live with greater gratitude, even though we go through pain and trials. Father, we are praying that you keep us and hold us closer to your bosom. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Mercy. What? Listen, listen. I know that, you know, we have people watching from all over the world, and I get it. You know, those in Trinidad, those in Barbados, those in England, I know you can't be here. But if you are in the vicinity of Huntsville, Alabama, you have to be here in person. I don't care how you get here. <laughs> listen. Just get here if you can. I, I'm telling you, he brought the heat today. The fire. He brought the fire. And if you can't stand the heat, <laughs> Get out of the kitchen. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk with him when he arrives today about uh, some of the challenges that people face mm -hmm. that make uh, those challenges that make it feel as though you're in the fire. Yes. How do you get out of the fire? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So we're going to talk more with him about that. But what a blessing. What an yes. absolute blessing yes. today here at the Oakwood University Church. If you could have seen the congregation, hands uplifted, many uh, contemplating the words that were yes. being spoken and yes. trying to really process it. And I'm sure that you, wherever you are, I'm sure as you watched this morning or as you joined us in worship this morning, that you too um, received a lot of what you may have been praying for. That is my prayer for you and, and my hope and we've got some hashtags yeah we have some hashtags and i know you have some prayer requests so, yes so uh the first hashtag is famine is seasonal uh, famine is seasonal temporary temporary mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another one of the hashtags this morning was play the hand you're given yeah play the hand you're given yeah absolutely. we've got some uno saints now <laughs> yes <laughs> We learned that term today. Uno apostles. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, another hashtag, um, double for your trouble. Double for your trouble. Double when for you your trouble. When you step out of, of, I mean, I know Pastor Snow will unpack it, but when you step out of what God has, you just bring more trouble on That's yourself. right. And if you will stay mm -hmm. and wait patiently, he will give you the double blessing, the double portion that he talked about his daughter receiving. So amen to that. Amen. And then what was our final hashtag? We had well, another we have one. Two more. We? I think two more? we have um, greater gratitude. Amen. Greater grat Hashtag greater gratitude. Express we need more to be gratitude. thankful. Mm. Thankful for what we have mm -hmm. and thankful for what we do don't have. That's in advance. We've been a, talking a, about yes. being thankful Absolutely. in advance of the blessing. Absolutely. Uh, so many things uh, to think about, to contemplate, mm -hmm. to, to feast on today. And I pray that you heard what you needed yes. uh, as you listened to the service today. We want to talk about what's going to happen this afternoon briefly. Um, Okay, so so well let let's let's we'll let the pastor yeah, talk well, about yeah, that. Yeah, let's um, let Pastor Snow unpack that. Um, I know there are a number of prayer requests. I know this message hit a number of people, mm -hmm. and we've had a number of people even uh, since our intercessory prayer time have put in requests for prayer. And in fact, a, a few have even sent in emails or text messages. So we want to remember these individuals in prayer. Sandra Smith is having some medical challenges. We are praying for you. We want to mention that today. Mm -hmm. Our sister Elaine Spivey there in North Carolina, we're praying for you. Uh, medical challenges as well. Pastor Carolyn Lesko mentioned several things that, um, that we would 
she asks that we pray about financial issues, marital situations. We'll be praying about that. And then Elder Daryl Alexander, we're praying for your health, uh, that you will overcome by the yes. blood of the lamb. Yes. And you are in our prayers as well. And if you have other prayer requests, we just ask that as we are saying this prayer, that as you petition God with us, that you mention those things because our heavenly father knows what things we have need of even before we ask. Amen. Amen. And so let's, let's take some time to just pray, especially for those individuals um, in our online community who are requesting special prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for the message today. We want to thank you that it was rich with treasure from heaven. Lord, whatever situation we're in, whether we're single or married or widowed or divorced, Whatever our situation and circumstance, there was a word for us. And the consistency of the word is that we are not alone. That you want us to remain in covenant with you. Yes. Regardless of what we've done or haven't done. Regardless of, of what our hand is. Regardless of how things have turned out. Even if we never planned it to be this way, Hmm. the reality is you are still with us. Yes. And Father, I pray for those individuals, those within our online church family, who recognize that with their particular situation and circumstance, they need you. And Father, I'm asking that you would move in their lives. That whatever they need, whether it's healing, whether it's financial blessings, Mm. whether it's uh, emotional stability, whether it's it's, uh, a a covenant relationship, whether it's uh, a marriage that's breaking up or Mm. contemplating marriage, whatever it may be, I pray that even now you would move in their lives. Father, help them, first of all, to covenant and surrender to you. Yes. And allow you to lead them into the direction they should go. Yes. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Please, Cleanse Father. us from all unrighteousness. Where yes. we have jumped from the frying pan into the fire. And we feel like we're being consumed. Father, I pray that you would place into our lives those things that would diffuse the heat and transform us into the person that you are making us and and, and molding us and wanting us to be yes. so that we can be ready yes, God. to go home with you. Lord, I pray for every relationship. I pray for every situation, every circumstance. And we thank you in advance. Yes, we do. We thank you for how you will move. Thank you. For when you will move. And the fact that you will move. Yes, God. And so we patiently wait. Yes. But not Passive waiting. Yes, God. But we will actively occupy while we wait. wait. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. And that is our prayer for you, that you will wait patiently while God is positioning himself to bless you in the way he knows you need it most. And again, if you want to connect with us, if you need prayer our prayer warriors we have a prayer team that prays every day every day so if you want a, a prayer if you want to be baptized just like mark and and jesse uh, dishman did if you want to be baptized if you want bible studies then just connect with us org forward slash connect hyphen card and just put your request there And we will take that and see to it accordingly. Yes. But God has something great in store for you. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Just 
wait. Don't just give up. Don't give don't up. Don't give up too soon. D- don't give don't up give too up soon. Don't give up too soon. Just wait on the Lord. Amen. You know, I love the fact that um, when you when you come together as a body of Christ, and I mention those who are viewing as a member as members Absolutely. of the body of Christ as Absolutely. well, because we're all connected in this and this this mm-hmm. spiritual walk. Uh, but when you come together, whether it be online or in person, you get this sense that you are not alone yes. in your struggle. Yes. And um, when the, the pastor was talking about the struggle this morning, there are so many individuals who are going through a struggle in their life. And you need to know that there's somebody else who's going through it with mm-hmm. you. But most of all, that God is going to bring you through it. There's camaraderie yes. in this faith. And so I thank yes. God for that. I thank God for um, allowing us to feel the connectedness yes. um, that Christianity brings. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. And, and you could feel that in the yes. sanctuary today. Yes. Yes. It, the, it, the, the atmosphere was electric. It was. Um, and it, then the song, the closing yeah. song. Thank you, Lord, yes. for what you've done for me. It could have been me in so many bad situations, but he didn't see fit to let any of those things be. But by his power, he's been blessing you and me. So I'm thankful yes. today that we have had this experience. And I pray that you felt it wherever you are, whether you're at home, whether you're attending to a, a sick loved one, whether you are going through a struggle of your own, just know that God is with you and he's going to bring you through. One day I was in the grocery store and I, I bumped into some students. Mm-hmm. Um, and this happens often when you live in a college community. Yeah. And I saw them buying some Kool-Aid. Okay. <laughs> and I said, are you all still drinking Kool-Aid? They said, Dean, this is struggle juice. Oh, mercy. <laughs> <laughs> So the struggle takes on all different forms. Yes, all different yes, forms. yes, yes. You know, um, um, it, it, it reminds me of, um, so I have a West Indian heritage um, and uh, my mother's Jamaican. Mm-hmm. And so in Jamaica, you have these Anansi stories. Yes. And so Anansi is a spider, you know, in, um, and who's kind of a trickster, but always mm-hmm. kind of gets one up. And uh, one of them talks about the fact that, um, you know, everybody was hungry. Um, in the village, everybody was hungry, but they really didn't have anything to eat. So Anansi, the spider, he had a pot, a, big, a large cauldron, and filled it with water and started stirring mm-hmm. it. And people began to say, what, what are you doing? You're just stirring a pot of water. He was like, I am, but you know what? If I had some potatoes, yes, that would I really that you know, make it um, well. So somebody ran One and got some potatoes. potatoes. And yes. Like, yeah, but you know, if I had some carrots, that, that, that would really do. So mm-hmm. somebody else ran and, and brought some carrots. And then, oh, yeah, but you know, if somebody else, you know, ha- if, if, if I just had a piece of meat, you know, mm-hmm. that would be good. So s- somebody brought s- some meat, et cetera. And so you, you, you can figure out the rest of the story. That he's, he's making a pot of stew. Exactly. And everybody's <laughs> contributing their One, little it, part to That's it. That's right. And then at the end, everybody gets to eat. Yes. That's the beauty of community. Amen. That's what we are trying to, Amen. to do here and the blessing here at the Oakwood University Church. And you, our online viewers, we are yes. a community. Everybody bringing something to, to this village. To, yes, to this to village. To the pot. And yes. as we stir, and then the, when the Holy Spirit, the, the, the spice mm-hmm. is added that it tastes good. You're giving us another sermon, Pastor. <laughs> oh, mercy. Praise mercy. the Lord this morning. It's been a blessing, hasn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. Listen, so uh, wonderful pa- fellowship. Um, Snell is here. He's here. We're so, going to yeah. talk about that message, and it was a pleasure fellowshipping with you today. Likewise, and I look forward to seeing you next the week. The next time. All yes, right. indeed. What a blessing. Pastor Snell, you brought the heat today. Oh, man. Uh, you brought the heat, and so we're going to talk about it. Thank you once again for your ministry and for all that you, you shared with us this morning. Oh, Got man. a lot of things to discuss and dissect so praise god praise god I, I know it's uh you know i know some of those things are a little uncomfortable to talk about mm-hmm. maybe a little uncomfortable here but i am thoroughly convinced that this was what god would have me amen. to say amen. to his people this weekend amen and we're appreciative you know we were looking um at some of the online viewers and the things they had to say and everyone was so blessed by so much of what was said we had one person however who said what if you talked a lot about marriage and mm-hmm. how you don't want to jump out of the the frying pan into the fire mm-hmm. loved what you said about the heat in the pan because it's evenly distributed that's right what about the viewer who asked what if my marriage is the fire <laughs> <laughs> Can I turn off the stove? Or what? So this is the thing. And, and I'm kind of talking out of my pastoral experience a little bit now. Because this is, and, and again, and I'm, I would never betray anybody's confidence, but there are certain sentiments that I've seen with some regularity. So when people, because there's a time. Now, and I need you to think of it in the context of our text today. Mm-hmm. 
So if you're in Canaan and the famine is ravaging the land, there's a season where it is unbearable, mm. where there is no crop, there is no water. You see your pantry <laughs> going down to that last cup of rice. Mm -hmm. Like in your mind, there is only one option. And for those who remained in promised land, it was only because they wintered that season when they could not see another way mm. that they were able to experience the miracle of God sending the bread yes. and bringing the famine to an end. And I think the thing that I want somebody to understand is that just because you can only see one way, that doesn't mean that there is only one way. And man, one of the things I love about Eloise, she makes a statement that God has a thousand ways that we know, not of. That we know mm -hmm. nothing of. And so that's why I, I want to just kind of encourage someone because sometimes, you know, and even as I talked about my experience, there are times where people kind of felt like it was unbearable and it wasn't until they chose a road that they found out was a much harder that's right. road, a much more painful road, a much more expensive road, a much more destructive road to children and offspring that they kind of rethought it and said what I thought was unbearable may have just been really, really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And let me just say this. I don't want to talk with, with, with blanket language mm -hmm. because everybody's situation is different. But what I'm saying to us is that I think that there is always another level spiritually, another level of prayer we can reach. Let me, let me just say this. Even as athletes, there's this thing called for runners called getting a second win. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing they say about second win, like scientists don't know how to completely explain it. But they basically say you never get a second win unless you run past the point of exhaustion. Yes. And it's only when you run through your exhaustion that like you're able to tap into reserves mm. that you don't get access to unless you push through the exhaustion. Amen. Amen. And I think the same thing is true at times with family is that there are times where you are exhausted. You are done. You ain't got nothing else to give. You feel like there's nothing left to offer. But sometimes until you push through that exhaustion that's when you get the second win and you realize I've got the strength to run on because this thing, I, I see it all the time in the body of Christ for every set of reasons. Somebody gives me to walk away. And again, there's, there's no condemnation because again, everybody's situation is different. Mm -hmm. I don't want to speak with blank blanket language because there are certain people that are very much victims of people who just abandoned their covenant mm -hmm. and my heart and sympathies are with their person. Cause you can't force someone to stay with you. But what I am saying is this, for, for every set of reasons that a couple gives me why they are divorced, I can point to 10 couples who've gone through those exact same circumstances and they abode or they remained in promised and land they and they were able to see the hand of the Lord do something that Amen. they didn't see as conceivable. Amen. Thank you for breaking that down. Mm. Um, you talked today. You said something that was very, very inspirational. You said we have to learn to forgive sooner mm -hmm. and apologize quicker. Mm -hmm. Help us with that because so many times it's hard to admit you're wrong. It's hard to forgive. Mm -hmm. Help us unpack that. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm you know, getting older is hard in some ways, but it gives you great clarity mm -hmm. um, because like there are things that we lose a lot of love over where we allow relationships, whether it's friendships, marriages, or even scenarios with our parents or extended family. And honestly, we allow those things to remain, remain fractured over things that have no spiritual or eternal consequence. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, I mean, you know, we will allow something as simple as somebody owing us money to allow us to be fractured, like $20, $30. It's not wrong that they didn't repay you, but come on, you, you, you spend it? that at Starbucks mm -hmm. two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is you never allow things that can't be replaced to fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. You only get one set of parents. Mm -hmm. Like you only get, you know, well, say you only get one true spouse. Fr <laughs> you true know what friends. I'm saying? You only get, friends. you know, true friends. Mm -hmm. They are not a dime or dozen. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so that that's the point. It's just like, it's just kind of looking at things. And weighing it. And weighing it. To determine it. is it really worth it to is give it up it? on something right. that is so, that is lifelong mm -hmm. over something that is temporary. Over temporary, yeah. And, and a lot of times, um, would you say that, the $30 isn't even the problem. It's mm. something deeper. It's something deeper. And so deeper. we need to try to examine what might be the underlying cause yeah. to help us rebuild the those The $30, it may be the symptom, mm -hmm. but you know, a broken trust may be the actual virus. But I think what happens is we spend so much time looking at symptoms 
that we never really get to really dealing with the relational viruses that cause discord or strife in families amongst siblings. Like, you know, too often in the African-American family, and, and it actually goes across the board, the only time we get together is a funeral. Mm-hmm. And once your family reaches a certain age, there, there are no more weddings. Mm-hmm. So in other words, once you and your siblings reach a certain age, all of your children are a certain age, there are no more weddings. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that's going to bring you together is, is a grief scenario. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing because like, we will walk through these grief scenarios and, and we see the family shrinking. We see the matriarchs falling asleep, the patriarchs falling asleep. And yet we still are operating under this faulty assumption that, okay, we'll get it together. We have more time. And this is a myth that I want to say. Like a lot of times we believe time heals all wounds. That's actually not true. Mm -hmm. Intentionality is what heals wounds. Mm -hmm. Humility is what heals wounds. Because what happens is time is almost kind of like when you, uh, you know, you cook something in your kitchen Mm -hmm. and whether it's a cake or something that has batter in it, like if you're going to clean it, it's better to clean it right away. While it's fresh. Because Mm -hmm. if you let it sit, it it's going to harden mm-hmm. and it's going to be required more and you more effort right now, right? To, mm-hmm. to get that mm-hmm. stain out mm-hmm. because you've let it sit too mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying is when it comes down to a fence, it's better to deal with it right away, which is why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Mm-hmm. Don't go to sleep while you're angry because when you let it sit, resentment builds, resentment then turns toxic. And if you allow the toxicity to linger too long, it becomes fatal to the relationship. And and what I'm saying to us, beloved, is that, you know, especially with this job. Listen, Sister Linda, we got a funeral this afternoon, Mm. one tomorrow, one Thursday, and another one next Sunday. So much loss. And and I bet you, I guarantee you, that if you could talk to any of these family members, if they could just get one more conversation. Oh, yes. One more day. One more hug. These things that we just think we have all the time in the world to, to, to be able to reconcile or heal or to address when tomorrow is not promised to anybody. What about the remaining family members? Because I know a lot of times family feuds erupt out of situations like this. Mm-hmm. How do we learn to forgive and get past past hurts? Okay, so, and this is where I think the gospel has to be at work in your life. So remember, so Jesus lays out a very, what seems like a very stringent standard. Mm-hmm. He says, if you don't forgive me and their trespasses, mm-hmm. I won't forgive you yours. And what Jesus is actually doing is he's actually laying out a methodology for forgiveness. Because, see, we think we're supposed to manufacture forgiveness. That's not true. Mm. We actually borrow forgiveness from the cup of grace that so abundantly flows to us. Say that again, please. So, so again, you don't manufacture forgiveness. You borrow it Mm -hmm. from the cup of grace that overflows with the mercy of God toward Amen. us. So, so really, when, in order to cancel your debt, all I got to do is subtract from my debt that's mercy, already been canceled mercy. by God. Mm-hmm. And honestly, look at it. I mean, how many times have you had to come to God and say, I'm sorry? Mm-hmm. How many times do we have to come and say, Lord, forgive me again? And, and, again, and after you say, Lord, I'll never do it again. I have to come and say, Lord, would you forgive me again? And, and when you look at the, the abundant grace that we have received, When you have received great grace, you tend to be a lot more liberal with grace Mm. to those that have offended us. And real talk, friends of mine, our offenses toward God are greater and mightier than the offenses that our brothers and sisters perpetrate toward us. Amen. And so that's how it functions. And yet God forgives. And yet God forgives. So that we are not supposed to be creators of grace. We are to be conduits of grace. Where as long as I'm connected to the source of grace, Mm -hmm. it flows through me. Mm -hmm. And as it's passing through, when my cup is full, like if I keep pouring water in this cup, it's just going to get so full. It by almost incidentally, it's just going to overflow to everything that's close to it. And when I'm functioning like a full cup of grace, grace is simply an incidental byproduct of me having a full cup of Jesus Mm -hmm. Christ. You know, we could go on and on about grace and forgiveness, and there's so much more to dissect. But let's mm-hmm. talk for a moment about this afternoon's yes, 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 Black, yes. Love, Black Love, the Black Love Seminar. Yes, yes, yes. Listen, we're excited. Listen, I'm going to encourage you to make sure that at 2.45, you go ahead and start logging into our Zoom space. We, I mean, no matter what your relationship status, there's something for you. Uh, for for our, you know, our couples, uh, doctors uh, Nicole and, and, and Malcolm Taylor are going to talk on the subject loss in translation. Mm. Communication is key. One of the most critical components of marriage. Then we have my wife, Gianna. Listen, I, I, she holds me down. Like we throw that term around. Oh, he holds me down. She holds me down. 
the only reason I'm able to do anything that I do is I've got somebody in a corner Amen. calling on the name of the Lord. Like, listen, there are times where it's, it's so funny, like, you know, you may wake up in the middle of the night because you, you can sense some movement in the room. And, and Gianna, she's just walking through the house, just praying, <laughs> praying. interceding, oh calling on man. the name of the Lord. Listen, I'm knocked out. Man of God, knocked out. <laughs> you know, but the woman of God is just Back praying prayer going on. and Back calling on prayer. the name of the Lord. But again, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And the reason we keep getting defeated is because we're fighting the, with the wrong weapons mm. because we don't know who the real enemy is. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Tucson Williams going to be talking about making the case for Christian education, mm. how Christian education affects the family. Pastor Raphael is going to be talking about, you know, developing or building our family chapel listen our we've got to get or reestablish the family altar getting the kids involved for those who are single uh pastor uh cadet and his wife nisha they're going to be talking about uh, a love worth waiting for they're going to be telling their own testimony about how they waited on the lord sister Danita jones is going to be talking about enduring or, or embracing the process uh, our own sister camille williams just wrote a book on on navigating the pain and and the and the difficulty of divorce she's going to be talking about how it affects the black community uh sister donna scott is going to be talking about dealing with grief in the african-american community oh and i miss doctors uh oliver and wendell uh uh excuse me elaine elaine, elaine oliver Willie mm -hmm. and Elaine Oliver. This I know I'm getting tired. Um, <laughs> they're going to be talking about how to deal with marriage in the context of the pandemic. So, man, there's just going to be a lot. You'll get a chance to participate in two of the of the sessions. First one is going to start at 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. Second one is going to start at 415. You don't need to register. The Zoom information is right there on our flyer. You can go to Breath of Life. Go and to Oak. Yes. O-U-C-S-D-A And we encourage forward you to do slash it early. Black Love. Yes. Yeah. www.oucsda.org forward slash Black Love. And if you're watching on Breath of Life, will yep. it be carried there as well? Mm -hmm. That's www.breathoflife.tv forward slash Black Love. You don't want to miss this. Last week, there were so many people mm -hmm. who joined in, and I'm sure this week there will be more. So yep. I encourage you to try to log in as quickly as you can. 245 is when it opens. So be, be there. I think we, we got 1,000 1, slots. And so once it's full. Once it's full, it's full. So jump on in there right at 245. Amen. Well, Pastor, once again, thank you for your ministry. Mm -hmm. Thank you for helping us understand uh, all of the nuances of what you spoke about today. We pray that God will continue yes. to bless you. A lot of encouragement. I Praise encourage God. you to go and look at it sometime and see all the people all right. who are blessed by your ministry, awesome. as are we. God bless you. God bless you. And I want to encourage us, stay with us next week. We're going to be talking on the subject, Black Wealth and Excellence. So next week, we're going to be doing some things that are going to help grow you uh, financially uh, so that we can give back and we can be dispensers of God's grace. And I want to make you aware, just stay with us each Wednesday night, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue our series entitled Signs. Going to be talking about how to discern God's direction, His will for your life. It's virtual. You don't even got to get out of bed. You can do this in your pajamas, in friends your of mine. In your it, and the word is going to come right there, right there to you. And then I want to make you aware of something that we have coming up about a month from now. One of the things I do annually is uh, I write an annual devotion for the amen, body of Christ. Amen. And uh, this year I'm excited about the new book. It's entitled Get Unrealistic. Thank you so Get much. Unrealistic. And it's talking about how radical faith releases you from the limitations of reality. And if I can just give you a quick kind of talk about what that's talking about. Please. Too often, like as the people of God, whenever we're developing a bold prayer list, a vision board, we start thinking big for, big for Jesus Christ. There's somebody that's going to come into that space and say, yeah, you know, that's good. Um, I understand. We got to think big, but we got to be more realistic. And, and one of the things I want the body of Christ to know is that you can't be a realist and a person of faith at the same time. Mm -hmm. The reason we don't see God do more is because we are too realistic. And what I want the body of Christ to know is that God said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, he says, I've come that they might have life and that, and that they more. might have it more abundantly. more abundantly. God's standard for us is abundant life. Mm -hmm. But because we're so realistic, we become conditioned with ordinary life. Mm. And what I'm saying is raise the standard. See, when we talk about raise the standard, we just be talking about dress and makeup and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But raising the standard means that I'm going to lay claim to everything that God mm -hmm. has ordained for me. Even if you don't see it. Even if you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And so God is calling us through this devotional to start praying some unrealistic prayers. Amen. To start laying claim to unrealistic promises. 
to, to, to really learn what faith is and what faith isn't. There's a lot of stuff out there that's talking about faith, but a lot of it's conjecture, it's hype. But this devotional, it is word and scripture based. It is scripture centered. And really it's about us learning how to lay claim to the promises of God in a real way. So what we're gonna be doing on starting on Sabbath, March 12th, we're gonna go begin a teaching series called Getting Unrealistic. But in addition to that, on March the 13th, we're gonna begin 21 days of prayer and consecration. Amen. That's gonna go from March the 13th through April the 2nd. So Oakwood and those who are part of our virtual Oakwood family, I want you to I want to talk to you about what all that's gonna be in all of what all is going to be involved in that. What we're going to do for 21 days straight is we're going to have an early morning prayer meeting through Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. And then we're going to meet at 8 a.m. on Sabbath and Sunday morning. During these 21 days, every Tuesday to Wednesday, we're going to be engaged in a 24-hour full fast from your last meal Tuesday to that same time on Wednesday. And for the 21 days, we're going to invite you to be engaged in a Daniel-style fast for those 21 days where, you know, we're abstaining from sweets, sugar. from sugar, mm -hmm. from dairy, from caffeine products, from flesh food products for the mastery of the body temple. If you can't say amen, just say ouch right there in the chat. <laughs> Listen, I need you to know we're going to be claiming some unrealistic health. Come on. Can I get a witness amen. out there? Amen. Unrealistic health for the 21 days. Amen. And then put that up. There's going to be a different emphasis each one week that first week what we're going to ask you to do is we're going to fast from all worry. worry. Oh my. We, listen, listen. We're going to we're going to have unrealistic faith because we're not going to worry. We're not going to fret. The second week I'm going to ask you to fast from all complaining. Stop complaining. All negative conversations. I, I don't want week. you to the, the whole week. I don't want you, I don't want to hear you talk about how strong the devil is. <laughs> like listen, we ain't giving him no glory that week. <laughs> then that third week, what we're going to ask you to do and this is going to be a little bit more personal, it's going to be a distraction fast. What I'm going to ask you to do is to lay aside whatever is consuming devotional mm, time. Mm. So for some people, that's going to be television. For others, it's going to be social media. For some people, it may be certain habits or, or a certain show or a certain movie. But time that could be dedicated mm -hmm. to God is being, is being consumed with the device. Like you get up, man, your first thing you do is you get on Instagram. Mm -hmm. First thing you do is you get on Facebook. First thing you do is, you know, you check in with your followers mm -hmm. on Twitter mm -hmm. as, a, as opposed to following Jesus Christ. Oh, like mind. whatever is eating up that time or distracting that space, I'm going to ask that you lay it aside so that you can dedicate that time to committed relationship with God. And one of the things I believe we're going to experience here at the Oakwood community, we're going to experience online, there's going to be a revival of faith. Oh, yes. There's going to be a chain reaction of belief. We're going to start seeing God do supernatural, extraordinary things. Oh, this once is exciting. We just stop it's exciting. being so realistic unrealistic yep. that's what faith is that's what it is it's, it's what looking it is. for what you don't see mm -hmm. and expecting what you have not experienced that's right yep. well I, you've given us a lot to look forward to um, a lot that we know will grow our faith mm -hmm. and will grow us in in the body of Christ and so I'm excited about this yes. thank you so much and if you um, have been blessed by what you've heard, please, please, please communicate that to us in the chat. Yes. Um, maybe you want to send an email or just a word of encouragement. Thank you so much. But Pastor. Can I, can I just say this too? Yes. Listen, I need you to be an electronic evangelist. I need you to be an Apple Tell apostle. Tell somebody. Listen, if you're on Facebook, just hit the share button five mm -hmm. times. Just hit it share five times so it goes out. It gets in circulation. If you're watching on YouTube, man, just copy the link. If today's message, if you know anybody that's a family in crisis, married, single, if you know this word is going to bless somebody, copy the link, mm -hmm. send it directly to them so that they can receive what we can receive and they can share in this joy that we have. It's another way of sharing your faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, Pastor, is there anything else you want to share with us before we I, say farewell until next week? I think we're good for now. We'll just go ahead, enjoy your meal. Enjoy your fellowship. Get online so that you can receive these blessings God has in store for you today. And join us this afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us in this worship experience. We look forward to seeing you again next week right here. God bless you in the meantime. God bless. Bye-bye. All right.